Chapter One of Maggie, A Girl of the Streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Maggie, A Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane. Chapter One. A very little boy stood upon a heap of gravel for the honour of Rum Alley. He was throwing stones at howling urchins from Devil's Row, who were circling madly about the heap and pelting at him. His infantile countenance was livid with fury. His small body was writhing in the delivery of great crimson oaths. "'Run, Jimmy, run! They'll get yous screamed a retreating rum alley child. Nah, responded Jimmy, with a valiant roar. There's me mix can't make me run. Howls of renewed wrath went up from devil's row throats. Tattered gammons on the right made a furious assault on the gravel heap. On their small, convulsed faces there shone the grins of true assassins. As they charged, they threw stones and cursed in shrill chorus. The little champion of Rum Alley stumbled precipitately down the other side. His coat had been torn to shreds in a scuffle, and his hat was gone. He had bruises on twenty parts of his body, and blood was dripping from a cut in his head. His wan features wore a look of a tiny, insane demon. On the ground, children from Devil's Row closed in on their antagonist. He crooked his left arm defensively about his head and fought with cursing fury. The little boys ran to and fro, dodging, hurling stones and swearing in barbaric trebles. From a window of an apartment house that upreared its form from amid squat, ignorant stables, there leaned a curious woman. Some labourers, unloading a scow at a dock at the river, paused for a moment and regarded the fight. The engineer of a passive tugboat hung lazily to a railing and watched. Over on the island a worm of yellow convicts came from the shadow of a grey, ominous building and crawled slowly along the river's bank. A stone had smashed into Jimmy's mouth. Blood was bubbling over his chin and down upon his ragged shirt. Tears made furrows on his dirt-stained cheeks. His thin legs had begun to tremble and turn weak, causing his small body to reel. His roaring curses at the first part of the fight had changed to a blasphemous chatter. In the yells of the whirling mob of Devil's Row children there were notes of joy like songs of triumph savagery. The little boys seemed to leer gloatingly at the blood upon the other child's face. Down the avenue came boastfully sauntering a lad of sixteen years, although the chronic sneer of an ideal manhood already sat upon his lips. His hat was tipped with an air of challenge over his eye. Between his teeth a cigar stump was tilted at the angle of defiance. He walked with a certain swing of the shoulders, which appalled the timid. He glanced over into the vacant lot in which the little raving boys from Devil's Row seethed about the shrieking and tearful child from Rum Alley. Gee, he murmured with interest, a scrap, gee. He strode over to the cursing circle, swinging his shoulders in a manner which denoted that he held victory in his fists. He approached at the back of one of the most deeply engaged of the Devil's Row children. Ah, what the hell, he said, and smote the deeply engaged one on the back of the head. The little boy fell to the ground and gave a hoarse, tremendous howl. He scrambled to his feet, and perceiving, evidently, the size of his assailant, 
ran quickly off, shouting alarms. The entire Devil's Row party followed him. They came to a stand a short distance away and yelled, taunting oaths at the boy with the chronic sneer. The latter momentarily paid no attention to them. What de hell, Jimmy? he asked of the small champion. Jimmy wiped his blood-wet features with his sleeve. Well, it was this way, Pete. See, I was going to lick that Riley kid, and they all pitched on me. Some rum alley children now came forward. The party stood for a moment, exchanging vainglorious remarks with Devil's Row. A few stones were thrown at long distances, and words of challenge passed between small warriors. Then the rum alley contingent turned slowly in the direction of their home street. They began to give, each to each, distorted versions of the fight. Causes of retreat in particular, cases were magnified. Blows dealt in the fight were enlarged to catapultian power, and stones thrown were alleged to have hurtled with infinite accuracy. Valor grew strong again and the little boys began to swear with great spirit. Ah, we blokies can lick the hell damn row, said a child swaggering. Little Jimmy was striving to stanch the flow of blood from his cut lips. Scowling, he turned upon the speaker. Ah, where the hell was ya when I was doing all the fighting? He demanded. Yous kids makes me tired. Ah, go it replied the other argumentatively. Jimmy replied with heavy contempt. Ah, yous can't fight, Blue Billy. I can lick you wid one hand. Ah, go on, replied Billy again. Ah, said Jimmy threateningly. Ah, said the other in the same tone. They struck at each other, clinched, and rolled over on the cobbled stones. Kick the damn guts out of him, yelled Peter the lad with the chronic sneer, in tones of delight. The small combatants pounded and kicked, scratched and tore. They began to weep, and their curses struggled in their throats with sobs. The other little boys clasped their hands and wriggled their legs in excitement. They formed a bobbing circle about the pair. A tiny spectator was suddenly agitated, Cheese it, Jimmy, cheese it. Here comes your father, he yelled. The circle of little boys instantly parted. They drew away and waited in ecstatic awe for that which was about to happen. The two little boys fighting in the modes of four thousand years ago did not hear the warning. Up the avenue there plodded slowly a man with sullen eyes. He was carrying a dinner pail and smoking an applewood pipe. As he neared the spot where the little boys strove, he regarded them listlessly. But suddenly he roared an oath and advanced upon the rolling fighters. Here, you Jim, get up now, while I belt your life out, you damned disorderly brat. He began to kick into the chaotic mass on the ground. The boy Billy felt a heavy boot strike his head. He made a furious effort and disentangled himself from Jimmy. He tottered away, damning. Jimmy arose painfully from the ground and, confronting his father, began to curse him. His parent kicked him. Come home now, he cried, and stop ye jawing, or I'll lame the everlasting head off yous. They departed. The man paced placidly along with the applewood emblem of serenity between his teeth. The boy followed a dozen feet in the rear. He swore luridly, for he felt that it was degradation for one who aimed to be some vague soldier, or a man of blood with a sort of sublime license, to be taken home by a father. End of chapter 1
of the streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Maggie, A Girl of the Streets, by Stephen Crane. Chapter 2 Eventually they entered into a dark region where, from a careening building, a dozen gruesome doorways gave up loads of babies to the street and the gutter. A wind of early autumn raised yellow dust from cobbles and swirled it against an hundred windows. Long streamers of garments fluttered from fire escapes. In all unhandy places there were buckets, brooms, rags and bottles. In the street infants played or fought with other infants or sat stupidly in the way of vehicles. Formidable women with uncombed hair and disordered dress gossiped while leaning on railings or screamed in frantic quarrels. Withered persons in curious postures of submission to something sat smoking pipes in obscure corners. A thousand odours of cooking food came forth to the street. The building quivered and creaked from the weight of humanity stamping about in its bowels. A small ragged girl dragged a red, bawling infant along the crowded ways. He was hanging back, baby-like, bracing his wrinkled, bare legs. The little girl cried out, Ah, Tommy, come on. There's Jimmy and Fudder. Don't be a-pulling me back. She jerked the baby's arm impatiently. He fell on his face, roaring. With a second jerk she pulled him to his feet, and they went on. With the obstinacy of his order, he protested against being dragged in a chosen direction. He made heroic endeavours to keep on his legs, denounce his sister, and consume a bit of orange peeling which he chewed between the times of his infantile orations. As the sullen-eyed man, followed by the blood-covered boy, drew near, the little girl burst into reproachful cries. Ah, Jimmy, you's been fighting again. The urchin swelled disdainfully. Ah, what de hell, Mag, see? The little girl upbraided him. You's always fighting, Jimmy and you knows it's put mother out when you's come home half dead. Ain't it like we'll all get a pounding? She began to weep. The babe threw back his head and roared at his prospects. Ah, what de hell, cried Jimmy. Shut up or I'll smack your mouth, see? As his sister continued her lamentations, he suddenly swore and struck her. The little girl reeled and recovering herself, burst into tears, and quaveringly cursed him. As she slowly retreated, her brother advanced, dealing her cups. The father heard and turned about. Stop that, Jim, do you hear? Leave your sister alone on the street. It's like I can never beat any sense into your damn wooden head. The urchin raised his voice in defiance to his parent and continued his attacks. The babe bawled tremendously, protesting with great violence. During his sister's hasty manoeuvres, he was dragged by the arm. Finally the procession plunged into one of the gruesome doorways. They crawled up dark stairways and along cold, gloomy halls. At last the father pushed open a door, and they entered a lighted room, in which a large woman was rampant. She stopped in a career from a seething stove to a pan-covered table. As the father and children filed in, she peered at them. Ah, what you been fighting again, by God! She threw herself upon Jimmy. The urchin tried to dart behind the others, and in the scuffle the babe, Tommy, was knocked down. He protested with his usual vehemence, because they had bruised his tender shins against a table leg. 
The mother's massive shoulders heaved with anger, grasping the urchin by the neck and shoulder she shook him until he rattled. She dragged him to an unholy sink, and, soaking a rag in water, began to scrub his lacerated face with it. Jimmy screamed in pain, and tried to twist his shoulders out of the clasp of the huge arms. The babe sat on the floor watching the scene, his face in contortions like that of a woman at a tragedy. The father, with a newly laden pipe in his mouth, crouched on a backless chair near the stove. Jimmy's cries annoyed him. He turned about and bellowed at his wife. Let the damn kid alone for a minute, will you, Mary? You're always pounding him. When I come nights, I can't get no rest, cause you're always pounding a kid. Let up, dear. Don't be always pounding a kid. The woman's operations on the urchin instantly increased in violence. At last she tossed him to a corner, where he limply lay cursing and weeping. The wife put her immense hands on her hips, and with a cheap tan-like stride approached her husband. Ho, she said, with a great grunt of contempt, and what in the devil are you sticking your nose for? The babe crawled under the table, and, turning, peered out cautiously. The ragged girl retreated, and the urchin in the corner drew his legs carefully beneath him. The man puffed his pipe calmly and put his great mudded boots on the back part of the stove. Go to hell, he murmured tranquilly. The woman screamed and shook her fists before her husband's eyes. The rough yellow of her face and neck flared suddenly crimson. She began to howl. He puffed imperturbably at his pipe for a time, but finally arose and began to look out at the window into the darkened chaos of backyards. "'You've been drinking, Mary,' he said. "'You'd better let up on the bot, old woman, or you'll get done.' "'You're a liar. I ain't had a drop,' she roared in reply. They had a lurid altercation in which they damned each other's souls with frequence. The babe was staring out from under the table, his small face working in his excitement. The ragged girl went stealthily over to the corner where the urchin lay. Are you hurted much, Jimmy? she whispered timidly. Not a damn bit, see? growled the little boy. Will I wash de blood? Nah. Will I? When I catch that Riley kid, I'll break his face. That's right, see? He turned his face to the wall as if resolved to grimly bide his time. In the quarrel between husband and wife, the woman was victor. The man grabbed his hat and rushed from the room, apparently determined upon a vengeful drunk. She followed to the door and thundered at him as he made his way downstairs. She returned and stirred up the room until her children were bobbing about like bubbles. Get out the way, she persistently bawled, waving feet with their dishevelled shoes near the heads of her children. She shrouded herself, puffing and snorting, in a cloud of steam at the stove, and eventually extracted a frying pan full of potatoes that hissed. She flourished it. Come to your suppers now, she cried, with sudden exasperation. Hurry up now, or I'll help you. The children scrambled hastily. With prodigious clatter they arranged themselves at table. The babe sat with his feet dangling high from a precarious infant chair, and gorged his small stomach. Jimmy forced, with feverish rapidity, the grease envelope pieces between his wounded lips. Maggie, with side glances of fear of interruption, ate like a small pursued tigress. The mother sat blinking at them. She delivered reproaches, swallowed potatoes, and drunk from a yellow-brown bottle. 
After a time her mood changed, and she wept as she carried little Tommy into another room and laid him to sleep with his fists doubled in an old quilt of faded red and green grandeur. Then she came and moaned by the stove. She rocked to and fro upon a chair, shedding tears and crooning miserably to the two children about their poor mother and their father. Damn his soul. The little girl plodded between the table and the chair with a dishpan on it. She tottered on her small legs beneath burdens of dishes. Jimmy sat nursing his various wounds. He cast furtive glances at his mother. His practiced eye perceived her gradually emerge from a muddled mist of sentiment until her brain burned in drunken heat. He sat breathless. Maggie broke a plate. The mother started to her feet, as if propelled. Good God! she howled. Her eyes glittered on her child with sudden hatred. The fervent red of her face turned almost to purple. The little boy ran to the halls, shrieking like a monk in an earthquake. He floundered about in darkness until he found the stairs. He stumbled, panic-stricken, to the next floor. An old woman opened a door. A light behind her threw a flare on the urchin's quivering face. Ah, oh, God, child! What is it this time? Is your father beating your mother, or your mother beating your father? End of Chapter 2「Chapter Three of Maggie, a Girl of the Streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Neil Donnelly. Maggie, a Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane. Chapter Three. Jimmy and the old woman listened long in the hall. Above the muffled roar of conversation, the dismal wailings of babies at night, the thumping of feet in unseen corridors and rooms, mingled with the sound of varied hoarse shoutings in the street and the rattling of wheels over cobbles, they heard the screams of the child and the roars of the mother die away to a feeble moaning and a subdued bass muttering. The old woman was a gnarled and leathery personage who could don at will an expression of great virtue. She possessed a small music box capable of one tune, and a collection of God bless yous pitched in assorted keys of fervency. Each day she took a position upon the stones of Fifth Avenue, where she crooked her legs under her and crouched immovable and hideous, like an idol. She received daily a small sum in pennies. It was contributed, for the most part, by persons who did not make their homes in that vicinity. Once, when a lady had dropped her purse on the sidewalk, the gnarled woman had grabbed it and smuggled it with great dexterity beneath her cloak. When she was arrested, she had cursed the lady into a partial swoon, and with her aged limbs, twisted from rheumatism, had almost kicked the stomach out of a huge policeman, whose conduct upon that occasion she referred to when she said, "'The police, damn em. "'Hey, Jimmy, it's cursed shame,' she said. "'Go now, like a dear, and buy me a can.' And if your mother raises hell all night, yous can sleep here. Jimmy took a tender tin pail and seven pennies and departed. He passed into the side door of a saloon and went to the bar. Straining up on his toes, he raised the pail and pennies as high as his arms would let him. He saw two hands thrust down and take them. Directly the same hands let down the filled pail, and he left. In front of the gruesome doorway he met a lurching figure. It was his father, swaying about on uncertain legs. "'Give me the can, see?' said the man threateningly. "'Ah, oh, come off! I got this can for that old woman, and it'd be dirt to swipe it, see?' cried Jimmy. The father wrenched the pail from the urchin. He grasped it in both hands and lifted it to his mouth. He glued his lips to the under edge and tilted his head. His hairy throat swelled until it seemed to grow near his chin. There was a tremendous gulping movement, and the beer was gone. The man caught his breath and laughed. 
He hit his son on the head with the empty pail. As it rolled clanging into the street, Jimmy began to scream and kicked repeatedly at his father's shins. "'Look at the dirt what you done me!' he yelled. "'The old woman'll be raising hell!' He retreated to the middle of the street, but the man did not pursue. He staggered toward the door. "'I'll club hell out of you when I catch you!' he shouted and disappeared. During the evening he had been standing against the bar, drinking whiskies and declaring to all comers confidentially, "'My home, regular living hell, damn this place, regular hell. Why do I come and drink whiskey here this way? Cause home, regular living hell.' Jimmy waited a long time in the street, and then crept warily up through the building. He passed with great caution the door of the gnarled woman, and finally stopped outside his home and listened. He could hear his mother moving heavily about among the furniture of the room. She was chanting in a mournful voice, occasionally interjecting bursts of volcanic wrath at the father, who, Jimmy judged, had sunk down on the floor or in a corner. "'Why the blazes don't you try to keep Jim from fighting? I'll break her jaw!' she suddenly bellowed. The man mumbled with drunken indifference. Uh, what the hell? What's odds? What makes kick? Because he tears his clothes, you damn fool, cried the woman in supreme wrath. The husband seemed to become aroused. Go to hell, he thundered fiercely in reply. There was a crash against the door, and something broke into clattering fragments. Jimmy partially suppressed the howl and darted down the stairway. Below he paused and listened. He heard howls and curses, groans and shrieks, confusingly in chorus, as if a battle were raging. Withal was the crash of splintering furniture. The eyes of the urchin glared in fear that one of them would discover him. Curious faces appeared in doorways, and whispered comments passed to and fro. Old Johnson's raising hell again. Jimmy stood until the noises ceased, and the other inhabitants of the tenement had all yawned and shut their doors. Then he crawled upstairs with the caution of an invader of a panther den. Sounds of labored breathing came through the broken door panels. He pushed the door open and entered, quaking. A glow from the fire threw red hues over the bare floor, the cracked and soiled plastering, and the overturned and broken furniture. In the middle of the floor lay his mother asleep. In one corner of the room his father's limp body hung across the seat of a chair, the urchin stole forward. He began to shiver in dread of awakening his parents. His mother's great chest was heaving painfully. Jimmy paused and looked down at her. Her face was inflamed and swollen from drinking. Her yellow brows shaded eyelids that had brown-blue. Her tangled hair tossed in waves over her forehead. Her mouth was set in the same lines of vindictive hatred that it had perhaps borne during the fight. Her bare red arms were thrown out above her head in positions of exhaustion, something mayhap like those of a sated villain. The urchin bended over his mother. He was fearful, lest she should open her eyes, and the dread within him was so strong that he could not forbear to stare, but hung as if fascinated over the woman's grim face. Suddenly her eyes opened. The urchin found himself looking straight into that expression which, it would seem, had the power to change his blood to salt. He howled piercingly and fell backward. The woman floundered for a moment, tossed her arms about her head as if in combat, and again began to snore. Jimmy crawled back in the shadows and waited. A noise in the next room had followed his cry at the discovery that his mother was awake. He groveled in the gloom, the eyes from out his drawn face riveted upon the intervening door. He heard it creak, and then the sound of a small voice came to him. "'Jimmy! Jimmy! Are you there?' it whispered. The urchin started. The thin white face of his sister looked at him from the doorway of the other room. She crept to him across the floor. The father had not moved, but lay in the same death-like sleep. The mother writhed in uneasy slumber, her chest wheezing as if she were in the agonies of strangulation. Out at the window a florid moon was peering over dark roofs, and in the distance the waters of a river glimmered pallidly. The small frame of the ragged girl was quivering. 
Her features were haggard from weeping, and her eyes gleamed from fear. She grasped the urchin's arm in her little trembling hands, and they huddled in a corner. The eyes of both were drawn by some force to stare at the woman's face, for they thought she need only to awake and all fiends would come from below. They crouched until the ghost mists of dawn appeared at the window, drawing close to the panes, and looking in at the prostrate, heaving body of the mother. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of Maggie, a Girl of the Streets》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ernie Bob. Maggie, a Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane. Chapter Four. The Babe Tommy died. He went away in a white, insignificant coffin, his small waxen hand clutching a flower that the girl, Maggie, had stolen from an Italian. She and Jimmy lived. The inexperienced fibres of the boy's eyes were hardened at an early age. He became a young man of leather. He lived some red years without labouring. During that time, his sneer became chronic. He studied human nature in the gutter and found it no worse than he thought he had reason to believe it. He never conceived a respect for the world, because he had begun with no idols that it had smashed. He clad his soul in armour by means of happening hilariously in at a mission church, where a man composed his sermons of use. While they got warm at the stove, he told his hearers just where he calculated they stood with the Lord. Many of the sinners were impatient over the pictured depths of their degradation. They were waiting for soup tickets. A reader of words of wind demons might have been able to see the portions of dialogue pass to and fro between the exoter and his hearers. You are damned, said the preacher, and the reader of sounds might have seen the reply go forth from the ragged people. Where's our soup? Jimmy and a companion sat in the rear seat and commented upon the things that didn't concern them with all the freedom of English gentlemen. When they grew thirsty and went out, their minds confused the speaker with Christ. Momentarily, Jimmy was sullen with thoughts of a hopeless altitude where grew fruit. His companion said that if he should ever meet God, he would ask for a million dollars and a bottle of beer. Jimmy's occupation for a long time was to stand on street corners and watch the world go by dreaming blood-red dreams at the passing of pretty women. He menaced mankind at the intersections of streets. On the corners he was in life and off life. The world was going on and he was there to perceive it. He maintained a belligerent attitude toward all well-dressed men. To him fine raiment was allied to weakness and all good coats covered faint hearts. He and his order were kings, to a certain extent, over the men of untarnished clothes because these latter dreaded, perhaps, to be either killed or laughed at? Above all things, he despised obvious Christians and ciphers with the chrysanthemums of aristocracy in their buttonholes. He considered himself above both of these classes. He was afraid of neither the devil nor the leader of society. When he had a dollar in his pocket, his satisfaction with existence was the greatest thing in the world. So, eventually, he felt obliged to work. His father died, and his mother's years were divided up into periods of thirty days. He became a truck driver. He was given the charge of a painstaking pair of horses in a large, rattling truck. He invaded the turmoil and tumble of the downtown streets and learned to breathe maledictory defiance at the police who occasionally used to climb up, drag him from his perch, and beat him. In the lower part of the city, he daily involved himself in hideous tangles. If he and his team chanced to be in the rear, he preserved a demeanour of serenity, crossing his legs and bursting forth into yells, when foot passengers took dangerous dives beneath the noises of his champing horses. 
He smoked his pipe calmly, for he knew that his pay was marching on. If, in the front and the key truck of chaos, he entered terrifically into the quarrel that was raging to and fro among the drivers on the high seats, and sometimes roared oaths and violently got himself arrested. After a time, his sneer grew so that it turned its glare upon all things. He became so sharp that he believed in nothing. To him the police were always actuated by malignant impulses, and the rest of the world was composed, for the most part, of despicable creatures who were all trying to take advantage of him, and with whom, in defence, he was obliged to quarrel on all possible occasions. He himself occupied a downtrodden position that had a private but distinct element of grandeur in its isolation. The most complete cases of aggravated idiocy were, to his mind, rampant upon the front platforms of all the street cars. At first his tongue strove with these beings, but he eventually was superior. He became immured like an African cow. In him grew a majestic contempt for these strings of street cars that followed him like intent bugs. He fell into the habit, when starting on a long journey, of fixing his eye on high and distant object, commanding his horses to begin, and then going into a sort of trance of observation. Multitude of drivers might howl in his rear, and his passengers might load him with opprobrium, but he would not awaken unless some blue policeman turned red and began to frenziedly tear bridles and beat the soft noises of the responsible horses. When he paused to contemplate the attitude of the police toward himself and his fellows, he believed that they were the only men in the city who had no rights. When driving about, he felt that he was held liable by the police for anything that might occur in the streets, and was the common prey of all energetic officials. In revenge, he resolved never to move out of the way of anything, until formidable circumstances, or a much larger man than himself, forced him to it. Foot passengers were mere pestering flies, with an insane disregard for their legs and his convenience. He could not conceive their maniacal desires to cross the streets. Their madness smote him with eternal amazement. He was continually storming at them from his throne. He sat aloft and denounced their frantic leaps, plunges, dives, and straddles. When they were thrust at, or parry, the noises of his champing horses, making them swing their heads and move their feet, disturbing a solid dreamy repose, he swore at the men as fools, for he himself could perceive that providence had caused it clearly to be written that he and his team had the unlineable right to stand in the proper path of the sun chariot, and if they so minded, obstruct its mission or take a wheel off. And perhaps, if the god driver had ungovernable desire to step down, put up his flame-coloured fists and manfully dispute the right of way, he would have probably been immediately opposed by a scowling mortal with two sets of very hard knuckles. It is possible, perhaps, that this young man would have derided, in an axle wide alley, the approach of a flying ferry-boat. Yet he achieved a respect for a fire-engine. As one charged toward his truck, he would fearfully drive upon a sidewalk threatening untold people with annihilation. When an engine would strike a mass of blocked trucks, splitting it into fragments, as a blow annihilates a cake of ice, Jimmy's team could usually be observed high and safe, with whole wheels, on the sidewalk. The fearful coming of the engine could break up the most intricate muddle of heavy vehicles, at which the police had been swearing for the half of an hour. A fire engine was enshrined in his heart, as an appalling thing that he loved with a distant, dog-like devotion. They had been known to overturn street-cars, those leaping horses, striking sparks from the cobbles in their forward lunge, were creatures to be ineffably admired. The clang of the gong pierced his breast like a noise of remembered war. When Jimmy was a little boy, he began to be arrested. Before he reached a great age, he had a fair record. He developed too great a tendency to climb down from his truck and fight with other drivers. He had been in quite a number of miscellaneous fights, and in some general baroom rows that had become known to the police. Once he had been arrested for assaulting a Chinaman. Two women in different parts of the city 
entirely unknown to each other, caused him considerable annoyance by breaking forth, simultaneously, at fateful intervals, into wailings about marriage and support and infants. Nevertheless, he had, on a certain starlit evening, said wonderingly and quite reverently, The moon looks like hell, don't it? End of chapter 4 Recording by Ernie Bob Chapter 5 of Maggie, A Girl of the Streets This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Jack Schwenderman Maggie, A Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane Chapter 5 The girl, Maggie, blossomed in a mud puddle. She grew to be a most rare and wonderful production of a tenement district, a pretty girl. None of the dirt of Rum Alley seemed to be in her veins. The philosophers, upstairs, downstairs, and on the same floor, puzzled over it. When a child, playing and fighting with gammons in the street, dirt disguised her. Attired in tatters and grime, she went unseen. There came a time, however, when the young men of the vicinity said, "'That Johnson Goyle is a pretty good looker.' About this period her brother remarked to her, "'Mag, I'll tell you this, see, you've either got to go to hell or go to work.' Whereupon she went to work, having the feminine aversion of going to hell. By chance she got a position in an establishment where they made collars and cuffs. She received a stool and a machine in a room where sat twenty girls of various shades of yellow discontent. She perched on the stool and treadled at her machine all day, turning out collars, the name of whose brand could be noted for its irrelevancy to anything in connection with collars. At night she returned home to her mother. Jimmy grew large enough to take the vague position of head of the family. As incumbent of that office, he stumbled upstairs late at night, as his father had done before him. He reeled about the room, swearing at his relations, or went to sleep on the floor. The mother had gradually arisen to that degree of fame that she could bandy words with her acquaintances among the police. Justices. Court officials called her by her first name. When she appeared, they pursued a course which had been theirs for months. They invariably grinned and cried out, Hello, Mary, you here again? Her gray head wagged in many a court. She always besieged the bench with voluble excuses, explanations, apologies, and prayers. Her flaming face and rolling eyes were a sort of familiar sight on the island. She measured time by means of sprees and was eternally swollen and disheveled. One day the young man, Pete, who as a lad had smitten the devil's row urchin in the back of the head and put to flight the antagonists of his friend Jimmy, strutted upon the scene. He met Jimmy one day on the street, promised to take him to a boxing match in Williamsburg, and called for him in the evening. Maggie observed Pete. He sat on a table in the Johnson home and dangled his checked legs with an enticing nonchalance. His hair was curled down over his forehead in an oiled bang. His rather pug nose seemed to revolt from contact with a bristling mustache of short, wire-like hairs. His blue, double-breasted coat, edged with black braid, buttoned close to a red puff tie, and his patent leather shoes looked like murder-fitted weapons. His mannerisms stamped him as a man who had a correct sense of his personal superiority. There was valor and contempt for circumstances in the glance of his eye. He waved his hands like a man of the world, who dismisses religion and philosophy and says, Fudge. He had certainly seen everything, and with each curl of his lip, he declared that it amounted to nothing. Maggie thought he must be a very elegant and graceful bartender. He was telling tales to Jimmy. 
Maggie watched him furtively with half-closed eyes lit with a vague interest. Holy gee, they makes me tired, he said. Most every day some farmer comes in and tries to run the shop, see? But they gets trod right out. I jolt them right out in the street before they knows where they is, see? Sure, said Jimmy. There was a mug come in the place the other day with an idea he was going to own the place. Holly gee, he was going to own the place? I see he had a still on and I didn't want to give him no stuff. So I says, get the hell out of here and don't make no trouble. I says like that, see? Get the hell out of here and don't make no trouble. Like that, get the hell out of here, I says, see? Jimmy nodded understandingly. Over his features played an eager desire to state the amount of his valor in a similar crisis, but the narrator proceeded. Well, the blokey, he says, to hell with it. I ain't looking for no scrap, he says. See? But he says, I'm spectable citizen, and I want a drink, and pretty damn soon, too. See? The hell, I says, like that. The hell, I says, see? Don't make no trouble, I says like that. Don't make no trouble, see? Then the mug he squared off and said he was fine as silk with his duke, see? And he wanted a drink damn quick. That's what he said, see? Sure, repeated Jimmy. Pete continued. Say, I just jumped the bar and the way I plunked that blokey was great, see? That's right, in the jaw, see? Holy gee! He trowed a spittoon through the front windy. Say, I thought I'd drop dead. But the boss, he comes in after and he says, Pete, yes done just right. You've got to keep order and it's all right, see? It's all right, he says. That's what he said. The two held a technical discussion. That bloke was a dandy, said Pete, in conclusion. But he hadn't ought to made no trouble. That's what I says to them. Don't come in here and make no trouble, I says, like that. Don't make no trouble, see? As Jimmy and his friend exchanged tales descriptive of their prowess, Maggie leaned back in the shadow. Her eyes dwelt wonderingly and rather wistfully upon Pete's face. The broken furniture, grimy walls, and general disorder and dirt of her home of a sudden appeared before her and began to take a potential aspect. Pete's aristocratic person looked as if it might soil. She looked keenly at him, occasionally wondering if he was feeling contempt. But Pete seemed to be enveloped in reminiscence. Holly gee, said he, those mugs can't faze me. They knows I can wipe up the street with any tree of them. When he said, ah, what the hell, his voice was burdened with disdain for the inevitable and contempt for anything that fate might compel him to endure. Maggie perceived that here was the beau ideal of a man. Her dim thoughts were often searching for faraway lands where, as God says, the little hills sing together in the morning. Under the trees of her dream gardens there had always walked a lover. End of chapter 5 Recording by Jack Schwenderman, Flemington, New Jersey Chapter 6 of Maggie, A Girl of the Streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Maggie, A Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane. Chapter 6 Pete took note of Maggie. Say, Mag, I'm stuck on your shape. It's out of sight, he said parenthetically with an affable grin. As he became aware that she was listening closely, he grew still more eloquent in his descriptions of various happenings in his career. It appeared that he was invincible in fights. Why, he said, referring to a man with whom he had had a misunderstanding. Dat mug scrapped like a damn dago. Dat's right, he was dead easy, see? He taught he was a scrapper, but he found out different. Holy gee! He walked to and fro in the small room, which seemed then to grow even smaller and unfit to hold his dignity, the attribute of a supreme warrior. 
that swing of the shoulders that had frozen the timid when he was but a lad had increased with his growth and education at the ratio of ten to one it combined with the sneer upon his mouth told mankind that there was nothing in space which could appall him maggie marveled at him and surrounded him with greatness she vaguely tried to calculate the altitude of the pinnacle from which he must have looked down upon her i met a chump de udder day way up in de city he said i was goin to see a friend o mine when i was across in de street de chump runned plump into me and then he turns round and says you're insolent ruffian he says like dat oh gee i says oh gee go to hell and get off de ert i says like dat see go to hell and get off de ert like dat den de blokey he got wild he says i was a contemptible scoundrel or somethin like dat and he says i was doomed to everlastin perdition and all like dat gee i says gee de hell i am i says de hell i am like dat and den i slugged him see with jimmy in his company pete departed in a sort of a blaze of glory from the johnson home maggie leaning from the window watched him as he walked down the street here was a formidable man who disdained the strength of a world full of fists here was one who had contempt for brass clothed power one whose knuckles could defiantly ring against the granite of law he was a knight the two men went from under the glimmering street lamp and passed into shadows turning maggie contemplated the dark dust-stained walls and the scant and crude furniture of her home a clock in a splintered and battered oblong box of varnished wood she suddenly regarded as an abomination she noted that it ticked raspingly the almost vanished flowers in the carpet pattern she conceived to be newly hideous some faint attempts she had made with blue ribbon to freshen the appearance of a dingy curtain she now saw to be piteous she wondered what pete dined on she reflected upon the collar and cuff factory it began to appear to her mind as a dreary place of endless grinding pete's elegant occupation brought him no doubt into contact with people who had money and manners it was probable that he had a large acquaintance of pretty girls he must have great sums of money to spend to her the earth was composed of hardships and insults she felt instant admiration for a man who openly defied it she thought that if the grim angel of death should clutch his heart pete would shrug his shoulders and say oh everything goes she anticipated that he would come again shortly she spent some of her week's pay in the purchase of flowered cretonne for a lambrequin she made it with infinite care and hung it to the slightly careening mantel over the stove in the kitchen she studied it with painful anxiety from different points in the room she wanted it to look well on sunday night when perhaps jimmy's friend would come on sunday night however pete did not appear afterward the girl looked at it with a sense of humiliation she was now convinced that pete was superior to admiration for lambrequins a few evenings later pete entered with fascinating innovations in his apparel as she had seen him twice and he had different suits on each time maggie had a dim impression that his wardrobe was prodigiously extensive say mag he said put on your best duds friday night and i'll take yous to de show see he spent a few moments in flourishing his clothes and then vanished without having glanced at the lambrequin over the eternal collars and cuffs in the factory maggie spent the most of three days in making imaginary sketches of pete and his daily environment she imagined some half dozen women in love with him and thought he must lean dangerously toward an indefinite one whom she pictured with great charms of person but with an altogether contemptible disposition she thought he must live in a blare of pleasure he had friends and people who were afraid of him she saw the golden glitter of the place where pete was to take her an entertainment of many hues and many melodies where she was afraid she might appear small and mouse-colored her mother drank whiskey all friday morning 
with lurid face and tossing hair, she cursed and destroyed furniture all Friday afternoon. When Maggie came home at half-past six, her mother lay asleep amidst the wreck of chairs and a table. Fragments of various household utensils were scattered about the floor. She had vented some phase of drunken fury upon the lambrequin. It lay in a bedraggled heap in the corner. Ha! she snorted, sitting up suddenly. Where de hell ya been? Why de hell don't ya come home earlier? Been loafin' round de streets. You're getting to be a regular devil. When Pete arrived, Maggie, in a worn black dress, was waiting for him in the midst of a floor strewn with wreckage. The curtain at the window had been pulled by a heavy hand and hung by one tack, dangling to and fro in the draft through the cracks at the sash. The knots of blue ribbons appeared like violated flowers. The fire in the stove had gone out. The displaced lids and open doors showed heaps of sullen gray ashes. The remnants of a meal, ghastly, like dead flesh, lay in a corner. Maggie's red mother, stretched on the floor, blasphemed and gave her daughter a bad name. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of Maggie, a Girl of the Streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by B. G. Oxford. Maggie, a Girl of the Streets, by Stephen Crane. Chapter 7. An orchestra of yellow silk women and bald-headed men on an elevated stage near the center of a great green-hued hall played a popular waltz. The place was crowded with people grouped about little tables. A battalion of waiters slid among the throng, carrying trays of beer glasses and making change from the inexhaustible vaults of their trouser pockets. Little boys in the costumes of French chefs paraded up and down the irregular aisles vending fancy cakes. There was a low rumble of conversation and a subdued clinking of glasses. Clouds of tobacco smoke rolled and wavered high in air about the dull gilt of the chandeliers. The vast crowd had an air throughout of having just quitted labor. Men with calloused hands and attired in garments that showed the wear of an endless trudge for a living, smoked their pipes contentedly, and spent five, ten, or perhaps fifteen cents for a beer. There was a mere sprinkling of kid-gloved men who smoked cigars, purchased elsewhere. The great body of the crowd was composed of people who showed that all day they strove with their hands. Quiet Germans, with maybe their wives and two or three children, sat listening to the music with the expression of happy cows. An occasional party of sailors from a warship, their faces pictures of sturdy health, spent the earlier hours of the evening at the small round tables. Very infrequent tipsy men, swollen with the value of their opinions, engaged their companions in earnest and confidential conversation. In the balcony, and here and there below, shone the impassive faces of women. The nationalities of the Bowery beamed upon the stage from all directions. Pete aggressively walked up a side aisle and took seats with Maggie at a table beneath the balcony. Two beers! Leaning back, he regarded with eyes of superiority the scene before them. This attitude affected Maggie strongly. A man who could regard such a sight with indifference must be accustomed to very great things. It was obvious that Pete had been to this place many times before, and was very familiar with it. A knowledge of this fact made Maggie feel little and new. He was extremely gracious and attentive. He displayed the consideration of a cultured gentleman who knew what was due. Say, what the hell? Bring the lady a big glass. What the hell uses dat pony? Don't be fresh now, said the waiter with some warmth as he departed. Eh, get off the cart, said Pete after the other's retreating form. Maggie perceived that Pete brought forth all his elegance and all his knowledge of high-class customs for her benefit. Her heart warmed as she reflected upon his condescension. The orchestra of yellow silk women and bald-headed men 
gave vent to a few bars of anticipatory music, and a girl in a pink dress with short skirts galloped upon the stage. She smiled upon the throng as if in acknowledgment of a warm welcome, and began to walk to and fro, making profuse gesticulations and singing in brazen soprano tones a song the words of which were inaudible. When she broke into the swift rattling measures of a chorus, some half-tipsy men near the stage joined in the rollicking refrain, and glasses were pounded rhythmically upon the tables. People leaned forward to watch her, and to try to catch the words of the song. When she vanished, there were long rollings of applause. Obedient to more anticipatory bars, she reappeared amidst the half-suppressed cheering of the tipsy men. The orchestra plunged into dance music, and the laces of the dancer fluttered and flew in the glare of gas jets. She divulged the fact that she was attired in some half-dozen skirts. It was patent that any one of them would have proved adequate for the purpose for which skirts are intended. An occasional man bent forward, intent upon the pink stockings. Maggie wondered at the splendor of the costume, and lost herself in calculations of the cost of the silks and laces. The dancer's smile of stereotyped enthusiasm was turned for ten minutes upon the faces of her audience. In the finale, she fell into some of those grotesque attitudes which were at the time popular among the dancers in the theaters uptown, giving to the Bowery public the fantasies of the aristocratic theater-going public at reduced rates. "'Say, Pete,' said Maggie, leaning forward, "'this is great!' Sure, said Pete, with proper complacence. A ventriloquist followed the dancer. He held two fantastic dolls on his knees. He made them sing mournful ditties and say funny things about geography and Ireland. Do those little men talk? asked Maggie. Nah, said Pete. It's some damn fake. See? Two girls on the bills as sisters came forth and sang a duet that is heard occasionally at concerts given under church auspices. They supplemented it with a dance, which, of course, can never be seen at concerts given under church auspices. After the duettist had retired, a woman of debatable age sang a Negro melody. The chorus necessitated some grotesque waddlings, supposed to be an imitation of a plantation darkie, under the influence, probably, of music and the moon. The audience was just enthusiastic enough over it to have her return and sing a sorrowful lay, whose lines told of a mother's love and a sweetheart who waited, and a young man who was lost at sea under the most harrowing circumstances. From the faces of a score or so in the crowd, the self-contained look faded. Many heads were bent forward with eagerness and sympathy. As the last distressing sentiment of the piece was brought forth, it was greeted by that kind of applause which rings as sincere. As a final effort, the singer rendered some verses which described a vision of Britain being annihilated by America, and Ireland bursting her bonds. A carefully prepared crisis was reached in the last line of the verse, where the singer threw out her arms and cried, The Star-Spangled Banner! Instantly a great cheer swelled from the throats of the assemblage of the masses. There was a heavy rumble of booted feet thumping the floor. Eyes gleamed with sudden fire, and calloused hands waved frantically in the air. After a few moments' rest, the orchestra played crashingly, and a small fat man burst out upon the stage. He began to roar a song and stamp back and forth before the footlights, wildly waving a glossy silk hat and throwing leers or smiles broadcast. He made his face into fantastic grimaces until he looked like a pictured devil on a Japanese kite. The crowd laughed gleefully. His short fat legs were never still a moment. He shouted and roared and bobbed his shock of red wig until the audience broke out in excited applause. Pete did not pay much attention to the progress of events upon the stage. He was drinking beer and watching Maggie. Her cheeks were blushing with excitement, and her eyes were glistening. She drew deep breaths of pleasure. No thoughts of the atmosphere of the collar and cuff factory came to her. When the orchestra crashed finally, they jostled their way to the sidewalk with the crowd. 
Pete took Maggie's arm and pushed away for her, offering to fight with a man or two. They reached Maggie's home at a late hour and stood for a moment in front of the gruesome doorway. Say, Mag, said Pete, give us a kiss for taking you to the show, will you? Maggie laughed, as if startled, and drew away from him. Nah, Pete, she said, that wasn't in it. Ah, what the hell, urged Pete. The girl retreated nervously. Ah, what the hell, repeated he. Maggie darted into the hall and up the stairs. She turned and smiled at him, then disappeared. Pete walked slowly down the street. He had something of an astonished expression upon his features. He paused under a lamp post and breathed a low breath of surprise. God, he said, I wonder if I've been played for a duffer. End of chapter 7 Recording by B.G. Oxford, December 2008Chapter 8 of Maggie, A Girl of the Streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Maggie, A Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane. Chapter 8. As thoughts of Pete came to Maggie's mind, she began to have an intense dislike for all of her dresses. What the hell ails you? What makes you be all this fixin' and fussin'? Good God! Her mother would frequently roar at her. She began to note with more interest the well-dressed women she met on the avenues. She envied elegance and soft palms. She craved those adornments of person which she saw every day on the street, conceiving them to be allies of vast importance to women studying faces. She thought many of the women and girls she chanced to meet smiled with serenity, as though forever cherished and watched over by those they loved. The air in the collar and cuff establishment strangled her. She knew she was gradually and surely shriveling in the hot, stuffy room. The begrimed windows rattled incessantly from the passing of elevated trains. The place was filled with a whirl of noises and odors. She wondered, as she regarded some of the grizzled women in the room, mere mechanical contrivances sewing seams and grinding out with heads bended over their work, tales of imagined or real girlhood happiness, past drunks, the baby at home, and unpaid wages. She speculated how long her youth would endure. She began to see the bloom upon her cheeks as valuable. She imagined herself in an exasperating future, as a scrawny woman with an eternal grievance. Too, she thought Pete to be a very fastidious person concerning the appearance of women. She felt she would love to see somebody entangle their fingers in the oily beard of the fat foreigner who owned the establishment. He was a detestable creature, he wore white socks with low shoes. He sat all day delivering orations in the depths of a cushioned chair. His pocketbook deprived them of the power of retort. What in the hell do you think I pay five dollars a week for? Play? No, but dumb. Maggie was anxious for a friend to whom she could talk about Pete. She would have liked to discuss his admirable mannerisms with a reliable mutual friend. At home, she found her mother often drunk and always raving. It seems that the world had treated this woman very badly, and she took a deep revenge upon such portions of it as came within her reach. She broke furniture as if she were at last getting her rights. She swelled with virtuous indignation as she carried the lighter articles of household use, one by one under the shadows of the three gilt balls, where Hebrews chained them with chains of interest. Jimmy came when he was obliged to by circumstances over which he had no control. His well-trained legs brought him staggering home and put him to bed some nights when he would rather have gone elsewhere. Swaggering Pete 
loomed like a golden sun to Maggie. He took her to a dime museum where rows of meek freaks astonished her. She contemplated their deformities with awe and thought them a sort of chosen tribe. Pete, raking his brains for amusement, discovered the Central Park Menagerie and the Museum of Arts. Sunday afternoons would sometimes find them at these places. Pete did not appear to be particularly interested in what he saw. He stood around looking heavy while Maggie giggled in glee. Once at the menagerie, he went into a trance of admiration before the spectacle of a very small monkey threatening to thrash a cageful because one of them had pulled his tail and he had not wheeled about quickly enough to discover who did it. Ever after, Pete knew that monkey by sight and winked at him, trying to induce him to fight with other and larger monkeys. At the museum, Maggie said, This is out of sight. Oh, hell, said Pete. Wait till next summer and I'll take us to a picnic. While the girl wandered in the vaulted rooms, Pete occupied himself in returning stony stare for stony stare, the appalling scrutiny of the watchdogs of the treasures. Occasionally, he would remark in loud tones, Did Jay's got glass eyes? in sentences of the sort. When he tired of this amusement, he would go to the mummies and moralize over them. Usually, he submitted with silent dignity to all which he had to go through, but at times he was goaded into comment. What the hell? he demanded once. Look at all these little jugs. Hundred jugs in a row, ten rows in a case, and about a thousand cases. What the blazes use is them? Evenings during the week, he took her to see plays in which the brain-clutching heroine was rescued from the palatial home of her guardian, who was cruelly after her bonds, by the hero with the beautiful sentiments. The latter spent most of his time out at soak in pale green snowstorms, busy with a nickel-plated revolver, rescuing aged strangers from villains. Maggie lost herself in sympathy with the wanderers swooning in snowstorms beneath happy-hued church windows, and a choir within singing, Joy to the World. To Maggie and the rest of the audience, this was transcendental realism. Joy always within, and they, like the actor, inevitably without. Viewing it, they hugged themselves in ecstatic pity of their imagined or real condition. The girl thought the arrogance and granite-heartedness of the magnate of the play was very accurately drawn. She echoed the maledictions that the occupants of the gallery showered on this individual when his lines compelled him to expose his extreme selfishness. Shady persons in the audience revolted from the pictured villainy of the drama. With untiring zeal, they hissed vice and applauded virtue. Unmistakably, bad men evinced an apparently sincere admiration for virtue. The loud gallery was overwhelmingly with the unfortunate and the oppressed. They encouraged the struggling hero with cries and jeered the villain, hooting and calling attention to his whiskers. When anybody died in the pale green snowstorms, the gallery mourned. They sought out the painted misery and hugged it as akin. In the hero's erratic march from poverty in the first act to wealth and triumph in the final one, in which he forgives all the enemies that he has left, he was assisted by the gallery, which applauded his generous and noble sentiments and confounded the speeches of his opponents by making irrelevant but very sharp remarks. Those actors who were cursed with villainy parts were confronted at every turn by the gallery. If one of them rendered lines containing the most subtle distinctions between right and wrong, the gallery was immediately aware if the actor meant wickedness, and denounced him accordingly. The last act was a triumph for the hero, poor and of the masses, the representative of the audience, over the villain and the rich man, his pockets stuffed with bonds and his heart packed with tyrannical purposes, 
imperturbable amid suffering. Maggie always departed with raised spirits from the showing places of the melodrama. She rejoiced at the way in which the poor and virtuous eventually surmounted the wealthy and wicked. The theater made her think. She wondered if the culture and refinement she had seen imitated, perhaps grotesquely, by the heroine on the stage, could be acquired by a girl who lived in a tenement house and worked in a shirt factory. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Maggie, a Girl of the Streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Alison Hester of Athens, Georgia. Maggie, a Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane. Chapter Nine a group of urchins were intent upon the side door of a saloon expectancy gleamed from their eyes they were twisting their fingers in excitement here she comes yelled one of them suddenly a group of urchins burst instantly asunder and its individual fragments were spread in a wide respectable half circle about the point of interest the saloon door opened with a crash and the figure of a woman appeared upon the threshold her gray hair fell in knotted masses about her shoulders. Her face was crimsoned and wet with perspiration. Her eyes had a rolling glare. Not a damn cent more of me money will yees ever get. Not a damn cent. I spent me money here for three years and now yees tell me you'll sell me no more stuff. Fell wid ya, Johnny Muckrell. Disturbance? Disturbance be damned. The hell wid ya, Johnny. The door received a kick of exasperation from within, and the woman lurched heavily out on the sidewalk. The gamins in the half-circle became violently agitated. They began to dance about and hoot and yell and jeer. Wide, dirty grins spread over each face. The woman made a furious dash at a particularly outrageous cluster of little boys. They laughed delightedly and scampered off a short distance, calling out over their shoulders to her. She stood, tottering on the curbstone, and thundered at them. "'Ye devil's kids!' she howled, shaking red fists. The little boys whooped in glee. As she started up the street, they fell in behind and marched uproariously. Occasionally she wheeled about and made charges on them. They ran nimbly out of reach and taunted her. In the frame of a gruesome doorway, she stood for a moment cursing them. Her hair straggled, giving her crimson features a look of insanity. Her great fists quivered as she shook them madly in the air. The urchins made terrific noises until she turned and disappeared. Then they filed quietly in the way they had come. The woman floundered about in the lower hall of the tenement house and finally stumbled up the stairs. On an upper hall, a door was open, and a collection of heads peered curiously out, watching her. With a wrathful snort, the woman confronted the door, but it was slammed hastily in her face, and the key was turned. She stood for a few minutes, delivering a frenzied challenge at the panels. "'Come out in de hall, Mary Murphy, damn ye, if yez want a row. Come on, ye overgrown terrier, come on!' She began to kick the door with her great feet. She shrilly defied the universe to appear and do battle. Her cursing troubles brought heads from all doors, save the ones she threatened. Her eyes glared in every direction. The air was full of her tossing fists. Come on, to hell damn gangalias, come on, she roared at the spectators. An oath or two, catcalls, jeers, and bits of facetious advice were given in reply. Missiles clattered about her feet. "'What the hell's the matter wid ya?' said a voice in the gathered gloom, and Jimmy came forward. He carried a tin dinner pail in his hand, and under his arm a brown truckman's apron done in a bundle. "'What the hell's wrong?' he demanded. "'Come out, all yez, come out!' His mother was howling. Come on, and I'll stamp her damn brains under me feet. 
shut your face and come home you damned old fool roared jimmy at her she strided up to him and twirled her fingers in his face her eyes were darting flames of unreasoning rage and her frame trembled with eagerness for a fight the hell widges and who the hell are yees i ain't given a snap of me fingers for yees she bawled at him she turned her huge back in tremendous disdain and climbed the stairs to the next floor jimmy followed cursing blackly at the top of the flight he seized his mother's arm and started to drag her toward the door of their room come home damn ye he gritted between his teeth take your hands off me take your hands off me shrieked his mother she raised her arm and whirled her great fist at her son's face jimmy dodged his head and the blow struck him in the back of the neck damn ye he gritted again he threw out his left hand and writhed his fingers about her middle arm the mother and the son began to sway and struggle like gladiators whoop said the rum alley tenement house the hall filled with interested spectators how old lady that was a dandy tree to one on the red ah stop your damn scrapping the door of the johnson home opened and maggie looked out jimmy made a supreme cursing effort and hurled his mother into the room he quickly followed and closed the door the rum alley tenement swore disappointedly and retired the mother slowly gathered herself up from the floor her eyes glittered menacingly upon her children here now said jimmy we've had enough of this sit down and don't make no trouble he grasped her arm and twisting it forced her into a creaking chair keep your hands off me roared his mother again damn your old hide yelled jimmy madly maggie shrieked and ran into the other room to her there came the sound of a storm of crashes and curses there was a great final thump and jimmy's voice cried there damn ye stay still maggie opened the door now and went warily out oh jimmy he was leaning against the wall and swearing blood stood upon bruises on his knotty forearms where they had scraped against the floor or the walls in the scuffle the mother lay screeching on the floor the tears running down her furrowed face maggie standing in the middle of the room gazed about her the usual upheaval of the tables and chairs had taken place crockery was strewn broadcast in fragments the stove had been disturbed on its legs and now leaned idiotically to the side a pail had been upset and water spread in all directions the door opened and pete appeared he shrugged his shoulders. Oh, God, he observed. He walked over to Maggie and whispered in her ear. Ah, oh, what the hell, Mag? Come on, we'll have a hell of a time. The mother in the corner upreared her head and shook her tangled locks. To hell with him and you, she said, glowering at her daughter in the gloom. Her eyes seemed to burn balefully. You've gone to the devil, Mag Johnson. Yez knows yez gone to the devil. You're a disgrace to your people, damn ye. And now, get out and go on with that dough-faced Jude of yours. Go to hell with him, damn ye, and good riddance. Go to hell and see how you likes it. Maggie gazed long at her mother. Go to hell now and see how you likes it. Get out. I won't have such as yous in my house. Get out, do you hear? Damn ye, get out. The girl began to tremble. At this instant, Pete came forward. Oh, what the hell, Mag, see? Whispered he softly in her ear. This all blows over. See, the old woman will be all right in the morning. Come on out with me. We'll have a hell of a time. The woman on the floor cursed. Jimmy was intent upon his bruised forearms. The girl cast a glance about the room filled with a chaotic mass of debris and at the red writhing body of her mother go to hell and good riddance she went end of chapter nine
Chapter Ten of Maggie, a Girl of the Streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Maggie, a Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane. Chapter Ten. Jimmy had an idea it wasn't common courtesy for a friend to come to one's home and ruin one's sister but he was not sure how much Pete knew about the rules of politeness. The following night he returned home from work at rather a late hour in the evening. In passing through the halls, he came upon the gnarled and leathery old woman who possessed the music box. She was grinning in the dim light that drifted through dust-stained panes. She beckoned to him with a smudged forefinger. "'Ah, Jimmy, what do you think I got on to last night?' It was de funniest ting I ever saw, she cried, coming close to him and leering. She was trembling with eagerness to tell her tale. I was by me door last night when your sister and her Jude feller came in, late, oh, very late. And she, the dear, was a-cryin' as if her heart would break, she was. It was de funniest ting I ever saw. And right out here by me door she asked him did he love her, did he? and she was a-cryin' as if her heart would break, poor ting, and him, I could see by de way that he said it, dat she had been askin' orfton, he says, Oh, hell, yes, he says, says he, Oh, hell, yes. Storm clouds swept over Jimmy's face, but he turned from the leathery old woman and plodded on upstairs. Oh, hell, yes, called she after him. She laughed a laugh that was like a prophetic croak. Oh, hell, yes, he says, says he. Oh, hell, yes. There was no one in at home. The rooms showed that attempts had been made at tidying them. Parts of the wreckage of the day before had been repaired by an unskillful hand. A chair or two and the table stood uncertainly upon legs. The floor had been newly swept. Two, the blue ribbons had been restored to the curtains, and the lambrequin, with its immense sheaves of yellow wheat and red roses of equal size, had been returned, in a worn and sorry state, to its position at the mantel. Maggie's jacket and hat were gone from the nail behind the door. Jimmy walked to the window and began to look through the blurred glass. It occurred to him to vaguely wonder, for an instant, if some of the women of his acquaintance had brothers. Suddenly, however, he began to swear. "'But he was me friend. I brought him here. That's de hell of it.' He fumed about the room, his anger gradually rising to a furious pitch. "'I'll kill de jay. That's what I'll do. I'll kill de jay.' He clutched his hat and sprang toward the door, but it opened and his mother's great form blocked the passage. "'What de hell's de matter wid ya?' exclaimed she, coming into the rooms. Jimmy gave vent to a sardonic curse and then laughed heavily. "'Well, Maggie's gone to de devil, dat's what, see?' "'Eh?' said his mother. "'Maggie's gone to de devil, are yous deaf?' roared Jimmy impatiently. "'De hell she has,' murmured the mother, astounded. Jimmy grunted and then began to stare out at the window. His mother sat down in a chair, but a moment later sprang erect and delivered a maddened whirl of oaths. Her son turned to look at her as she reeled and swayed in the middle of the room, her fierce face convulsed with passion, her blotched arms raised high in imprecation. "'May God curse her forever!' she shrieked. "'May she eat nothing but stones and de dirt in de street! May she sleep in de gutter and never see de sun shine again! De damn—' "'Here now,' said her son, "'take a drop on yourself.' The mother raised lamenting eyes to the ceiling. "'She's de devil's own child, Jimmy,' she whispered. "'Ah, who would tink such a bad girl could grow up in our family, Jimmy, me son? Many de hour I've spent in talk with dat girl, and told her if she ever went on de streets I'd see her damned. And after all her bringin' up, and what I told her and talked with her, she goes to de bad like a duck to water. The tears rolled down her furrowed face, her hands trembled. And den when dat Sadie McAllister next door to us was sent to de devil by dat feller dat worked in de soap factory, 
didn't I tell our Mag that if she... Ah, dat's another story, interrupted the brother. Of course, dat Sadie was nice and all dat, but, see, it ain't the same as if... Well, Maggie was different, see, she was different. He was trying to formulate a theory that he had always unconsciously held, that all sisters, excepting his own, could advisedly be ruined. He suddenly broke out again. I'll go tump hell out of de mug what did her de harm. I'll kill him. He tinks he can scrap, but when he gets me a chase in him, he'll find out where he's wrong, de damn duffer. I'll wipe up de street wid him. In a fury, he plunged out of the doorway. As he vanished, the mother raised her head and lifted both hands, entreating. May God curse her forever, she cried. In the darkness of the hallway, Jimmy discerned a knot of women talking volubly. When he strode by, they paid no attention to him. She always was a bold thing, she heard one of them cry in an eager voice. There wasn't a feller come to de house but she tried to mash him. My Annie says de shameless ting tried to catch her feller, her own feller, when we used to know his father. I could a told you dis two years ago, said a woman in a key of triumph. Yes, sir, it was over two years ago did I says to my old man, I says, dat Johnson girl ain't straight, I says. Oh, hell, he says, oh, hell. Dat's all right, I says, but I know what I knows, I says, and it'll come out later. You wait and see, I says, you see. Anybody what had eyes could see that there was something wrong with dat girl. I didn't like her actions. On the street Jimmy met a friend. What de hell? asked the latter. Jimmy explained. And I'll tump him till he can't stand. Oh, what de hell, said the friend. What's de use? You'll get pulled in. Everybody'll be on to it. And ten plunks, gee. Jimmy was determined. He tinks he can scrap, but he'll find out different. Gee, remonstrated the friend. What de hell? End of chapter 10Chapter 11 of Maggie, A Girl of the Streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Maggie, A Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane. Chapter 11 On a corner, a glass-fronted building shed a yellow glare upon the pavements. The open mouth of a saloon called seductively to passengers, to enter and annihilate sorrow or create rage. The interior of the place was papered in olive and bronze tints of imitation leather. A shining bar of counterfeit massiveness extended down the side of the room. Behind it a great mahogany-appearing sideboard reached the ceiling. Upon its shelves rested pyramids of shimmering glasses that were never disturbed. Mirrors set in the face of the sideboard multiplied them. Lemons, oranges, and paper napkins, arranged with mathematical precision, sat among the glasses. Many hued decanters of liquor perched at regular intervals on the lower shelves. A nickel-plated cash register occupied a position in the exact center of the general effect. The elementary senses of it all seemed to be opulence and geometrical accuracy. Across from the bar a smaller counter held a collection of plates, upon which swarmed frayed fragments of crackers, slices of boiled ham, disheveled bits of cheese, and pickles swimming in vinegar. An odor of grasping begrimed hands and munching mouths pervaded. Pete, in a white jacket, was behind the bar bending expectantly toward a quiet stranger. A beer, said the man. Pete drew a foam-topped glassful and set it dripping upon the bar. At this moment the light bamboo doors at the entrance swung open and crashed against the siding. Jimmy and a companion entered. They swaggered unsteadily but belligerently toward the bar and looked at Pete with bleared and blinking eyes. Gin, said Jimmy. Gin, said the companion. Pete slid a bottle and two glasses along the bar. He bended his head sideways as he assiduously polished away with a napkin at the gleaming wood. 
he had a look of watchfulness upon his features. Jimmy and his companion kept their eyes upon the bartender, and conversed loudly in tones of contempt. "'He's a dandy masher, ain't he, by God?' laughed Jimmy. "'Oh, hell, yes,' said the companion, sneering widely. "'He's great, he is. Get on to de mug on de bloke. Dat's enough to make a feller turn handsprings in his sleep.' The quiet stranger moved himself and his glass a trifle further away, and maintained an attitude of oblivion. "'Gee, ain't he hot stuff! Get on to his shape, great God!' Hey! cried Jimmy, in tones of command. Pete came along slowly, with a sullen dropping of the under lip. Well, he growled, what's eatin' yez? Gin, said Jimmy. Gin, said the companion. As Pete confronted them with the bottle and the glasses, they laughed in his face. Jimmy's companion, evidently overcome with merriment, pointed a grimy forefinger in Pete's direction. "'Say, Jimmy,' demanded he, "'what de hell is dat behind de bar?' "'Damned if I knows,' replied Jimmy. They laughed loudly. Pete put down a bottle with a bang and turned a formidable face toward them. He disclosed his teeth, and his shoulders heaved restlessly. "'You fellers can't guy me,' he said. "'Drink your stuff and get out, and don't make no trouble.' Instantly the laughter faded from the faces of the two men, and expressions of offended dignity immediately came. "'Who de hell has said anything to you?' cried they in the same breath. The quiet stranger looked at the door calculatingly. "'Ah, come off,' said Pete to the two men. "'Don't pick me up for no jay. Drink your rum and get out, and don't make no trouble.' "'Oh, de hell,' airily cried Jimmy." Oh, de hell, airily repeated his companion. We goes when we get ready, see, continued Jimmy. Well, said Pete in a threatening voice, don't make no trouble. Jimmy suddenly leaned forward with his head on one side. He snarled like a wild animal. Well, what if we does, see, said he. Dark blood flushed into Pete's face, and he shot a lurid glance at Jimmy. "'Well, den, we'll see who's de best man, you or me,' he said. The quiet stranger moved modestly towards the door. Jimmy began to swell with valor. "'Don't pick me up for no tenderfoot. When you tackles me, you tackles one of de best men in de city, see? I'm a scrapper, I am. Ain't dat right, Billy?' "'Sure, Mike,' responded his companion in tones of conviction. "'Oh, hell,' said Pete easily. Go fall on yourself. The two men again began to laugh. What de hell is dat talkin? cried the companion. Damned if I knows, replied Jimmy with exaggerated contempt. Pete made a furious gesture. Get out of here now and don't make no trouble. See, you fellers are lookin' for a scrap and it's damn likely you'll find one if you keeps on shootin' off your mouths. I know yous, see? I can lick better men than yous ever saw in your lives. Dat's right. See? Don't pick me up for no stuff, or you might be jolted out in de street before you knows where you is. When I comes from behind dis bar, I trows yous boat in de street. See? Oh, hell! cried the two men in chorus. The glare of a panther came into Pete's eyes. Dat's what I said. Understand? He came through a passage at the end of the bar and swelled down upon the two men. They stepped promptly forward and crowded close to him. They bristled like three roosters. They moved their heads pugnaciously and kept their shoulders braced. The nervous muscles about each mouth twitched with a forced smile of mockery. "'Well, what the hell you're going to do?' gritted Jimmy." Pete stepped warily back, waving his hands before him to keep the men from coming too near. "'Well, what de hell you're going to do?' repeated Jimmy's ally. They kept close to him, taunting and leering. They strove to make him attempt the initial blow. "'Keep back now. Don't crowd me,' ominously said Pete. Again they chorused in contempt. "'Oh, hell!' 
In a small tossing group, the three men edged for positions like frigates contemplating battle. "'Well, why de hell don't you try to throw us out?' cried Jimmy and his ally with copious sneers. The bravery of bulldogs sat upon the faces of the men. Their clenched fists moved like eager weapons. The allied two jostled the bartender's elbows, glaring at him with feverish eyes and forcing him toward the wall. Suddenly Pete swore redly. The flash of action gleamed from his eyes. He threw back his arm and aimed a tremendous, lightning-like blow at Jimmy's face. His foot swung a step forward, and the weight of his body was behind his fist. Jimmy ducked his head, bowery-like, with the quickness of a cat. The fierce answering blows of him and his ally crushed on Pete's bowed head. The quiet stranger vanished. The arms of the combatants whirled in the air like flails. The faces of the men, at first flushed to flame-colored anger, now began to fade to the pallor of warriors in the blood and heat of a battle. Their lips curled back and stretched tightly over the gums in ghoul-like grins. Through their white, gripped teeth struggled hoarse whisperings of oaths. Their eyes glittered with murderous fire. Each head was huddled between its owner's shoulders, and arms were swinging with marvelous rapidity. Feet scraped to and fro with a loud scratching sound upon the sanded floor. Blows left crimson blotches upon pale skin. The curses of the first quarter minute of the fight died away. The breaths of the fighters came wheezingly from their lips, and the three chests were straining and heaving. Pete at intervals gave vent to low, labored hisses that sounded like a desire to kill. Jimmy's ally gibbered at times like a wounded maniac. Jimmy was silent, fighting with the face of a sacrificial priest. The rage of fear shone in all their eyes, and their blood-colored fists swirled. At a tottering moment a blow from Pete's hand struck the ally, and he crashed to the floor. He wriggled instantly to his feet, and grasping the quiet stranger's beer-glass from the bar, hurled it at Pete's head. High on the wall it burst like a bomb, shivering fragments flying in all directions. Then missiles came to every man's hand. The place had heretofore appeared free of things to throw, but suddenly glass and bottles went singing through the air. They were thrown point-blank at bobbing heads. The pyramid of shimmering glasses, that had never been disturbed, changed to cascades as heavy bottles were flung into them. Mirrors splintered into nothing. The three frothing creatures on the floor buried themselves in a frenzy for blood. There followed in the wake of missiles and fists some unknown prayers, perhaps for death. The quiet stranger had sprawled very pyrotechnically out on the sidewalk. A laugh ran up and down the avenue for the half of a block. "'Dave trowed a bloke into de street!' People heard the sound of breaking glass and shuffling feet within the saloon, and came running. A small group, bending down to look under the bamboo doors, watching the fall of glass and three pairs of violent legs, changed in a moment to a crowd. A policeman came charging down the sidewalk and bounced through the doors into the saloon. The crowd bended and surged in absorbing anxiety to see. Jimmy caught first sight of the oncoming interruption. On his feet he had the same regard for a policeman that, when on his truck, he had for a fire engine. He howled and ran for the side door. The officer made a terrific advance, club in hand. One comprehensive sweep of the long nightstick threw the ally to the floor and forced Pete to a corner. With his disengaged hand he made a furious effort at Jimmy's coat-tails. Then he regained his balance and paused. Well, well, you are a pair of pictures. What in hell you been up to? Jimmy, with his face drenched in blood, escaped up a side street, pursued a short distance by some of the more law-loving or excited individuals of the crowd. Later, from a corner safely dark, he saw the policeman, the ally, and the bartender emerge from the saloon. Pete locked the doors, and then followed up the avenue in the rear of the crowd-encompassed policeman and his charge. On first thoughts, Jimmy, with his heart throbbing at battle heat, started to go desperately to the rescue of his friend, but he halted. Ah, what de hell, he demanded of himself. 
End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Maggie, a Girl of the Streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Maggie, a Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane. Chapter Twelve. In the Hall of Irregular Shape, said Pete and Maggie, drinking beer, a submissive orchestra, dictated too by a spectacled man with frowsy hair and a dress suit industriously followed the bobs of his head and the waves of his baton a ballad singer in a dress of flaming scarlet sang in the inevitable voice of brass when she vanished men seated at the tables near the front applauded loudly pounding the polished wood with their beer glasses she returned attired in less gown and sang again she received another enthusiastic encore she reappeared in still less gown and danced the deafening rumble of glasses and clapping of hands that followed her exit indicated an overwhelming desire to have her come on for the fourth time but the curiosity of the audience was not gratified maggie was pale from her eyes had been plucked all look of self-reliance she leaned with a dependent air towards her companion she was timid as if fearing his anger or displeasure she seemed to beseech tenderness of him pete's air of distinguished valor had grown upon him until it threatened stupendous dimensions. He was indefinitely gracious to the girl. It was apparent to her that his condescension was a marvel. He could appear to strut, even while sitting still, and he showed that he was a lion of lordly characteristics by the air of which he spat. With Maggie gazing at him wonderingly, he took pride in commanding the waiters, who were, however, indifferent or deaf. Hi, you, get a rustle on yous. What the hell you looking at to my beards, do you hear? He leaned back and critically regarded the person of a girl with a straw-coloured wig, who upon the stage was flinging her heels in somewhat awkward imitation of a well-known danseuse. At times Maggie told Pete long, confidential tales of her former home life, dwelling upon the escapades of the other members of the family, and the difficulties she had to combat in order to obtain a degree of comfort. He responded in tones of philanthropy. He pressed her arm with an air of reassuring proprietorship. They was them jays, he said, denouncing the mother and brother. The sound of the music, which by the efforts of the frowsy-headed leader drifted to her ears through the smoke-filled atmosphere, made the girl dream. She thought of her former Rom Alley environment and turned to regard Pete's strong, protecting fists. She thought of the collar and cuff manufactory and the eternal moan of the proprietor, what in hell do you think I pay five dollars a week for? Play? No pie dumb. She contemplated Pete's men subduing eyes, and noted that wealth and prosperity were indicated by his clothes. She imagined the future, rose-tinted, because of its distance, from all that she previously had experienced. As to the present, she perceived only vague reasons to be miserable. Her life was Pete's, and she considered him worthy of the charge. She would be disturbed by no particular apprehensions so long as Pete adored her, as he now said he did. She did not feel like a bad woman. To her knowledge, she had never seen any better. At times men at other tables regarded the girl furtively. Pete, aware of it, nodded at her and grinned. He felt proud. Mac, you're a bloomin' good looker, he remarked, studying her face through the haze. The men made Maggie fear, but she blushed at Pete's words as it became apparent to her that she was the apple of his eye. Grey-headed men, wonderfully pathetic in their dissipation, stared at her through the clouds. Smooth-cheeked boys, some of them with faces of stone and mouths of sin, not nearly so pathetic as the grey hats, tried to find the girl's eyes in the smoke wreaths. Maggie considered she was not what they sought her. She confined her glances to Pete and the stage. The orchestra played negro melodies, a versatile drummer pounded, whacked, clattered and scratched on a dozen machines to make noise. Those glances of the men, shot at Maggie from under half-closed lids, made her tremble. She thought them all to be worse men than Pete. Come, let's go, she said. As they went out, Maggie perceived two women, seated at a table with some men. They were painted, and their cheeks had lost their roundness. As she passed them, the girl with a shrinking movement drew back her skirts. End of chapter 12. 
Recording by Vanessa Di Steppen, Berlin, Germany. Chapter 13 of Maggie, A Girl of the Streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alana Jordan. Maggie, A Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane. Chapter 13. Jimmy did not return home for a number of days after the fight with Pete in the saloon. When he did, he approached with extreme caution. He found his mother raving. Maggie had not returned home. The parent continually wondered how her daughter could come to such a pass. She had never considered Maggie as a pearl dropped unstained into Rum Alley from heaven, but she could not conceive how it was possible for her daughter to fall so low as to bring disgrace upon her family. She was terrific in denunciation of the girl's wickedness. The fact that the neighbors talked of it maddened her. When women came in, and in the course of their conversation casually asked, Where's Maggie these days? The mother shook her fuzzy head at them and appalled them with curses. Cunning hints, inviting confidence, she rebuffed with violence. And with all the bringing up she had, how could she? Moaningly she asked of her son. With all the talkin' with her I did, and the things I told her to remember, when a girl is bringed up the way I bringed up Maggie, how can she go to the devil? Jimmy was transfixed by these questions. He could not conceive how under the circumstances his mother's daughter and his sister could have been so wicked. His mother took a drink from a squudgy bottle that sat on the table. She continued her lament. She had a bad heart, that girl did, Jimmy. She was wicked to the heart, and we never knowed it. Jimmy nodded, admitting the fact. We lived in the same house with her, and I brought her up, and we never knowed how bad she was. Jimmy nodded again. With a home like this and a mother like me, she went to the bad, cried the mother, raising her eyes. One day Jimmy came home, sat down in a chair, and began to wriggle about with a new and strange nervousness. At last he spoke shamefacedly. Well, look a here. This ting queers us. See, we're queered. And maybe it'd be, be better if I think I can look her up, and maybe it'd be better if I fetched her home, and... The mother started from her chair and broke forth into a storm of passionate anger. What? Let her come and sleep under the same roof with her mother again? Oh, yes, I will, won't I? Sure. Shame on yous, Jimmy Johnson, for saying such a thing to your own mother. To your own mother. Little did I think when yous was a baby playing about me feet that you'd grow up to say such a thing to your mother, your own mother. I'd never taught. Sobs choked her and interrupted her reproaches. There ain't nothing to raise such hell about, said Jimmy. I only says it that I'd be better if we keep this ting dark. See, it queers us. See? His mother laughed a laugh that seemed to ring through the city and be echoed and re-echoed by countless other laughs. Oh, yes, I will, won't I? Sure. Well, you must take me for a damn fool, said Jimmy, indignant at his mother for mocking him. I didn't say we'd make er into a little tin angel, nor nothing, but the way it is now she can queer us, don't you see? I shall get tired of the life after a while, and then she'll be wanna be coming home, won't she, the beast? I'll let her in then, won't I? Well, I didn't mean none of this prodigal business anyway, explained Jimmy. It wasn't no prodigal daughter, you damn fool, said the mother. It was prodigal son, anyhow. I know that, said Jimmy. For a long time they sat in silence. The mother's eyes gloated on a scene her imagination could call before her. Her lips were set in a vindictive smile. Ah, she'll cry, won't she, and carry on, and tell how Pete or some other fellow beats her, and she'll say she's sorry and all that, and she ain't happy, she ain't, 
and she wants to come home again, she does. With grim humor, the mother imitated the possible wailing notes of the daughter's voice. Then I'll take her in, won't I, de beast? She'll cry her eyes out on the stones of the street before I'll dirty the place with her. She abused and ill-treated her own mother, her own mother, what loved her, and she'll never get another chance this side of hell. Jimmy thought he had a great idea of women's frailty, but he could not understand why any of his kin should be victims. Damn her, he fervidly said. Again he wondered vaguely if some of the women of his acquaintance had brothers. Nevertheless, his mind did not for an instant confuse himself with those brothers, nor his sister with theirs. After the mother had, with great difficulty, suppressed the neighbors, she went among them and proclaimed her grief. May God forgive that girl was her continual cry. To a ten of ears she recited the whole length and breadth of her woes. I bringed her up de way a daughter ought to be bringed up, and dis is how she served me. She went to the devil de first chance she got. May God forgive her. When arrested for drunkenness, she used the story of her daughter's downfall with telling effect upon the police justices. Finally, one of them said to her, peering down over his spectacles, Mary, the records of this and other courts show that you are the mother of forty-two daughters who have been ruined. The case is unparalleled in the annals of this court, and this court thinks. The mother went through life, shedding large tears of sorrow. Her red face was a picture of agony. Of course, Jimmy publicly damned his sister that he might appear on a higher social plane. But arguing with himself, stumbling about in ways that he knew not, he, once, almost came to a conclusion that his sister would have been more firmly good had she better known why. However, he felt that he could not hold such a view. He threw it hastily aside. End of chapter 13 Recording by Alana Jordan in St. Louis, Missouri Chapter 14 of Maggie, A Girl of the Streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daisy 55. Maggie, A Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane. Chapter 14. In a hilarious hall, there are twenty-eight tables and twenty-eight women, and a crowd of smoking men. Violent noise was made on a stage at the end of the hall by an orchestra composed of men who looked as if they had just happened in. Sword waiters ran to and fro, swooping down like hawks on the unwary in the throng, clattering along the aisles with trays covered with glasses, stumbling over woman's skirt, and charging two prices for everything but beer, all with a swiftness that blurred the view of the coconut palms and dusty monstrosities painted upon the walls of the room. A bouncer, with an immense load of business upon his hands, plunged about in the crowd, dragging bashful strangers to prominent chairs, ordering waiters here and there, and quarreling furiously with men who wanted to sing with the orchestra. The usual smoke cloud was present, but so dense that heads and arms seemed entangled in it. The rumble of conversation was replaced by a roar. Plenteous oath heaved through the air. The room rang with the shrill voices of women bubbling over with drink or laughter. The chief element in the music of the orchestra was speed. The musicians played in intent fury. A woman was singing and smiling upon the stage, but no one took notice of her. The rate at which the piano, cornet, and violins were going seemed to impart wildness to the half-drunken crowd. Beer glasses were empty at a gulp, and conversation became a rapid chatter. The smoke ebbed and swirled like shadowy river hurrying toward some unseen falls. Pete and Maggie entered the hall and took chairs at a table near the door. 
The woman who was seated there made an attempt to occupy Pete's attention, and, failing, went away. Three weeks had passed since the girl had left home. The air of spangle-like dependence had been magnified and showed its direct effect in the particular off-handedness and ease of Pete's ways toward her. She followed Pete's eyes with hers, anticipating with smiles, gracious looks from him. A woman of brilliance and audacity, accompanied by a mere boy, came into the place and took seats near them. At once, Peter sprang to his feet, his face beaming with glad surprise. By God, there's Nellie, he cried. He went over to the table and held out an eager hand to the woman. Why, hello, Peter, my boy, and how are you? She said, giving him her fingers. Maggie took instant note of the woman. She perceived that her black dress fitted her to perfection. Her linen collar and cuffs were spotless. Tan gloves were stretched over her well-shaped hands. A hat of prevailing fashion perched jauntily upon her dark hair. She wore no jewelry and was painted with no apparent paint. She looked clear-eyed through the stares of the men. Sit down and call your lady friend over, she said cordially to Pete. At his beckoning, Maggie came and sat between Pete and the mere boy. I thought you were going away for good, began Peter once. When did you get back? How about them buffalo business turn out? The woman shrugged her shoulders. Well, he didn't have as many stamps as he tried to make out. So I shook them all. That's all. Well, I'm glad to see he's back in the city, said Pete with awkward gallantry. He and the woman entered into a long conversation, exchanging reminiscences of days together. Maggie sat still, unable to formulate an intelligent sentence upon the conversation, and painfully aware of it. She saw Pete's eyes sparkled as he gazed upon the handsome stranger. He listened smilingly to all she said. The woman was familiar with all his affairs, asked him about mutual friends, and knew the amount of his salary. She paid no attention to Maggie looking toward her once or twice, and apparently seeing the wall beyond. The mere boy was sulky. In the beginning he had welcomed with acclamations the additions. Let's all have a drink. What do you take, Nell? And you, Miss, what's your name? Have a drink, Mr. You know what I mean. He had shown a sprightly desire to do the talking for the company, and tell all about his family. In a loud voice he declaimed on various topics. He assumed a patronizing air toward Pete. As Maggie was silent, he paid no attention to her. He made a great show of lavishing wealth upon the woman of brilliance and audacity. Do keep still, Freddy. You gibber like an ape, dear, said the woman to him. She turned away and devoted her attention to Pete. Well have many a good time together again, eh? Sure, Mike, said Pete, enthusiastic at once. Say, whispered she, leaning forward, let's go over to Billy's and have a hell of a time. Well, it's this way, see, said Pete. I got this lady friend here. Oh, to help of her, argued the woman. Pete appeared disturbed. All right, she said, nodding her head at him. All right for you. We'll see the next time you ask me to go anywheres with you. Pete squirmed. Say, he said beseechingly, come wild me a mint, and I'll tell you why. The woman waved her hand. Oh, that's all right. You didn't explain, you know. You wouldn't come merely because you wouldn't come. That's all there is of it. To Pete's visible distress, she turned to the mere boy, bringing him speedily from a terrific rage. He had been debating whether it would be the part of a man to pick a quarrel with Pete, or would he be justified in striking him savagely with his beer glass without warning. But he recovered himself when the woman turned to renew her smilings. He beamed upon her with an expression that was somewhat 
tipsy and inexpressibly tender. Say, shake that Bowery J, requested he in a loud whisper. Freddy, you are so droll, she replied. Pete reached forward and touched the woman on the arm. Come out a minute while I tears ye, why I can't go with you. You do me dirt, Nell. I never taught ye do me dirt, Nell. Come on, will you? He spoke in tones of injury. Why? I don't see why I should be interested in your explanations, said the woman with a coldness that seemed to reduce Pete to a pulp. His eyes pleaded with her. Come out in a minute, wise I tell you. The woman nodded slightly at Maggie and the mere boy. Excuse me. The mere boy interrupted his loving smile and turned a shriveling glare upon Pete. His boyish countenance flushed, and he spoke in a whine to the woman. Oh, I say, Nellie, this isn't a square deal, you know. You aren't going to leave me and go off with that duffer, are you? I should think. Why, you dear boy, of course I'm not, cried the woman affectionately. She bended over and whispered in his ear. He smiled again and settled in his chair, as if resolved to wait patiently. As the woman walked down between the rows of tables, Pete was at her shoulder, talking earnestly, apparently in explanation. The woman waved her hands with steady airs of indifference. The door swung behind them, leaving Maggie and the mere boy seated at the table. Maggie was dazed. She could dimly perceive that something stupendous had happened. She wondered why Pete saw fit to remonstrate with the woman, pleading for forgiveness with his eyes. She thought she noted an air of submission about her lean on Pete. She was astounded. The mere boy occupied himself with cocktails and a cigar. He was tranquilly silent for half an hour. Then he bestirred himself and spoke. Well, he said, sighing, I knew this was the way it would be. There was another stillness. The mere boy seemed to be musing. She was pulling me leg. That's the whole amount of it, he said suddenly. It's a blooming shame the way that girl does. Why, I spent over two dollars in drinks tonight. And she goes off with that plug ugly who looks as if he's been hit in the face with a corn die. I call it rocky treatment for a fellow like me. Here, waiter, bring me a cocktail and make it damn strong. Maggie made no reply. She was watching the doors. It's a mean piece of business, complained the mere boy. He explained to her how amazing it was that anybody should treat him in such a manner. But I'll get square with her. You bet. She won't get far ahead of yours truly, you know, he added, winking. I'll tell her plainly that it was blooming mean business. And she won't come it over me with any of her now Freddy dears. She thinks my name is Freddy, you know, but of course it ain't. I always tell these people some name like that because if they got into your right name, they might use it sometime. Understand? Oh, they don't fool me much. Maggie was paying no attention. Being attentive upon the doors, the mere boy relapsed into a period of gloom during which he exterminated a number of cocktails with a determined air, as if relying defiantly to fate. He occasionally broke forth into sentences composed of infectives joined together in a long string. The girl was still staring at the doors. After a time, the mere boy began to see cobwebs just in front of his nose. He spurred himself into being agreeable and insisted upon her having a charlie russe and a glass of beer. There's gone, he remarked. There's gone. He looked at her through the smoke well. Shay, little girl. We might as well make best of it. You ain't such bad looking girl, you know. Not half bad. Can't come up to Nell, though. No, can't do it. Well, I should say not. Nell, fine looking girl. Fair fine, any. Fine. You look damn bad alongside her, but by yourself ain't so bad. Have you do it anyhow? Nail gone? Only you left. Not bad, though. Maggie stood up. 
I'm going home, she said. Then the mere boy started. Eh, what? Home? He cried, struck with amazement. I beg pardon? Did he say home? I am going home, she repeated. Great God, what a hell of a struck! demanded the mere boy of himself, stupefied. In a semi-comatose state, he conducted her on board an uptown car, obstinately paid her fare, leered kindly at her through the rear window, and fell off the steps. End of chapter 14 Recording by Daisy 55 Chapter 15 of Maggie, A Girl of the Streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daisy 55. Maggie, A Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane. Chapter 15. A forlorn woman went along a lighted avenue. The street was filled with people desperately bound on missions. An endless crowd darted at the elevated station stairs, and the horse cars were thronged with owners of bundles. The pace of the forlorn woman was slow. She was apparently searching for someone. She loitered near the doors of saloons, and watchmen emerged from them. She scanned futilely the faces in the rushing stream of pedestrians. Harrying men, bent on catching some boat or train, jostled her elbows, falling to notice her, their thoughts fixed on distant dinners. The forlorn woman had a peculiar face. Her smile was no smile, but when in repose her features had a shadowy look that was like a sardonic grin, as if someone had sketched with a cruel forefingers indelible lines about her mouth. Jimmy came strolling up the avenue. The woman encountered him with an aggrieved air. Oh, Jimmy, I've been looking all over for you, she began. Jimmy made an impatient gesture and quickened his pace. Oh, don't bother me, good God, he said, with a savageness of a man whose life is pestered. The woman followed him along the sidewalk in somewhat the manner of a suppliant. But, Jimmy, she said, ye told me ye... Jimmy turned upon her fiercely as if resolved to make a last stand to comfort and peace. Say, for God's sakes, Hattie, don't follow me from one end of the city till the other. Let her, will you? Give me a minute rest, can't you? Ye makes me tired, all's a-tagging me. See, ain't ye's got no sin? Do ye's want people to get on to me? Go chase yourself, for God's sakes. The woman stepped closer and laid her fingers on his arm. But look at here. Jimmy said, oh, go to hell. He darted into the front door of a convenient saloon and a moment later came out into the shadows that surrounded the side door. On the brilliantly lighted avenue, he perceived the forlorn woman dodging about him like a scout. Jimmy laughed with an air of relief and went away. When he arrived home, he found his mother clamoring. Maggie had returned. She stood shivering beneath the torrent of her mother's wrath. Well, I'm damned, said Jimmy in greeting. His mother, tottering about the room, pointed a quivering forefinger. Look at here, Jimmy, look at here. This your sister, boy. There's your sister. Look at her, look at her. She screamed in scoffling laughter. The girl stood in the middle of the room. She edged about as if unable to find a place on the floor to put her feet. Ha, 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 below the mother. There she stands, ain't she pretty? Look at her. Ain't she sweet, the beast? Look at her. Ha, <laughs> look at her. She lurched forward and put her red and seamed hands upon his daughter's face. She bent down and peered keenly up into the eyes of the girl. Oh, she just deceived me, ain't she ever was, ain't she? She's a mother's party, darling little, ain't she? Look at her, Jimmy. Come here for God's sake and look at her. The loud and tremendous sneering of the mother brought the dozens of the rum alley tenement to their doors. Women came in the hallways. Children scurried to and fro. What's up? 
the Johnson's party on the other there? Nah, young Mags come home. The hell you say? Through the open doors, curious eyes stared in at Maggie. Children ventured into the room and oogled her as if they formed the front row at a theater. Woman without bended toward each other and whispered nodding their heads with airs of profound philosophy. A baby, overcome of curiosity concerning this object at which all were looking, slided forward and touched her dress, cautiously, as if investigating a red-hot stove. Its mother's voice rang out like a warning triumph. She rushed forward and grabbed her child, casting a terrible look of indignation at the girl. Maggie's mother paced to and fro, addressing the door full of eyes, expounding like a glib showman at a museum. Her voice rang through the building. There she stands, she cried, wheeling suddenly and pointing with dramatic finger. There she stands. Look at her. Ain't she a ditty? And she was so good as to come home to her mother. She was. Ain't she a beauty? Ain't she a ditty? For God's sakes! The jeering cries ended in another bust of sheer laughter. The girl seemed to awaken. Jimmy? He drew hastily back from her. Well now, you're a hell of a thing, ain't you? He said, his lips curling in scorn, radiant virtue sat upon his brow, and his repelling hands expressed horror of contamination. Maggie turned and went. The crowd at the door fell back precipitately. A baby fallen down in front of the door. Wretch a scream like a wounded animal from his mother. Another woman sprang forward and picked it up with a shiverous air, as if rescuing a human being from an ongoing express train. As the girl passed down through the hall, she went before open doors framing more eyes strangely microscopic and sending broad beams of exquisite light into the darkness of her path. On the second floor she met the gnarled old woman who possessed the music box. So, she cried, is ye are back again, is ye? And it kicks ye out? Well, come on in and stay with me tonight. I ain't got no more standing. From above came an unseeing babble of tongues, over all of which rang the mother's decisive laughter. End of chapter fifteen. Recording by Daisy Fifty Five. Chapter sixteen of Maggie, a girl of the streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Neil Donnelly. Maggie, a Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane. Chapter 16. Pete did not consider that he had ruined Maggie. If he had thought that her soul could never smile again, he would have believed the mother and brother who were pyrotechnic over the affair to be responsible for it. Besides, in his world, souls did not insist upon being able to smile. What the hell? He felt a trifle entangled. It distressed him. Revelations and scenes might bring upon him the wrath of the owner of the saloon, who insisted upon respectability of an advanced type. What the hell do they want to raise such a smoke about it for? demanded he of himself, disgusted with the attitude of the family. He saw no necessity for anyone's losing their equilibrium merely because their sister or their daughter had stayed away from home. Searching about in his mind for possible reasons for their conduct, he came upon the conclusion that Maggie's motives were correct, but that the two others wished to snare him. He felt pursued. The woman of brilliance and audacity whom he had met in the hilarious hall showed a disposition to ridicule him. A little pale thing with no spirit, she said. 
Did you note the expression of her eyes? There was something in them about pumpkin pie and virtue. That is the peculiar way the left corner of her mouth has of twitching, isn't it? Dear, dear, my cloud-compelling Pete, what are you coming to? Pete asserted at once that he never was very much interested in the girl. The woman interrupted him, laughing. Oh, it's not of the slightest consequence to me, my dear young man. You needn't draw maps for my benefit. Why should I be concerned about it? But Pete continued with his explanations. If he was laughed at for his tastes in women, he felt obliged to say that they were only temporary or indifferent ones. The morning after Maggie had departed from home, Pete stood behind the bar. He was immaculate in white jacket and apron, and his hair was plastered over his brow with infinite correctness. No customers were in the place. Pete was twisting his napkin fist slowly in a beer glass, softly whistling to himself, and occasionally holding the object of his attention between his eyes and a few weak beams of sunlight that had found their way over the thick screens and into the shaded room. With lingering thoughts of the woman of brilliance and audacity, the bartender raised his head and stared through the varying cracks between the swaying bamboo doors. Suddenly the whistling pucker faded from his lips. He saw Maggie walking slowly past. He gave a great start, fearing for the previously mentioned eminent respectability of the place. He threw a swift, nervous glance about him, all at once feeling guilty. No one was in the room. He went hastily over to the side door, opening it and looking out. He perceived Maggie standing as if undecided on the corner. She was searching the place with her eyes. As she turned her face toward him, Pete beckoned to her hurriedly, intent upon returning with speed to a position behind the bar and to the atmosphere of respectability upon which the proprietor insisted. Maggie came to him, the anxious look disappearing from her face and a smile wreathing her lips. Oh, Pete, she began brightly. The bartender made a violent gesture of impatience. Oh, my God, he cried, he vehemently. What the hell do you want to hang round here for? Do you want to get me into trouble? He demanded with an air of injury. Astonishment swept over the girl's features. Why, Pete, you just told me. Pete glanced profound irritation. His countenance reddened with the anger of a man whose respectability is being threatened. Say, yous makes me tired, see? What the hell do you want to tag her on at me for? you get me into trouble with the old man, and there'll be hell to pay. If he sees a woman on here, he'll go crazy, and I'll lose me job, see? Your brother come in here and raised hell, and the old man had to put up for it. And now I'm done, see, I'm done. The girl's eyes stared into his face. Pete, don't you remember? Oh, hell, interrupted Pete, anticipating. The girl seemed to have a struggle with herself. She was apparently bewildered and could not find speech. Finally, she asked in a low voice, "'But where can I go?' The question exasperated Pete beyond the powers of endurance. It was a direct attempt to give him some responsibility in a manner that did not concern him. In his indignation, he volunteered information. "'Oh, go to hell!' cried he. He slammed the door furiously and returned, with an air of relief to his respectability. Maggie went away. She wandered aimlessly for several blocks. She stopped once and asked aloud a question of herself. Who? A man who was passing near her shoulder humorously took the questioning word as intended for him. Her what? Who? Nobody. I didn't say anything, he laughingly said, and continued his way. Soon the girl discovered that if she walked with such apparent aimlessness, some men looked at her with calculating eyes. She quickened her step, frightened. As a protection, she adopted a demeanor of intentness, as if going somewhere. After a time, she left rattling avenues and passed between rows of houses with sternness and stolidity stamped upon their features. She hung her head, for she felt their eyes grimly upon her. Suddenly she came upon a stout gentleman in a silk hat and a chaste black coat, whose decorous row of buttons reached from his chin to his knees. The girl had heard of the grace of God, and she decided to approach this man. 
His beaming, chubby face was a picture of benevolence and kind-heartedness. His eyes shone goodwill. But as the girl timidly accosted him, he gave a convulsive movement and saved his respectability by a vigorous sidestep. He did not risk it to save a soul. For how was he to know that there was a soul before him that needed saving? End of chapter 16《Chapter Seventeen of Maggie, a Girl of the Streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Neil Donnelly. Maggie, a Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane. Chapter Seventeen. Upon a wet evening, several months after the last chapter, two interminable rows of cars pulled by slipping horses jangled along a prominent side street. A dozen cabs with coat-and-shrouded drivers clattered to and fro. Electric lights whirring softly shed a blurred radiance. A flower dealer, his feet tapping impatiently, his nose and his wares glistening with raindrops, stood behind an array of roses and chrysanthemums. Two or three theatres emptied a crowd upon the storm-swept pavements. Men pulled their hats over their eyebrows and raised their collars to their ears. Women shrugged impatient shoulders in their warm cloaks and stopped to arrange their skirts for a walk through the storm. People, having been comparatively silent for two hours, burst into a roar of conversation, their hearts still kindling from the glowings of the stage. The pavements became tossing seas of umbrellas. Men stepped forth to hail cabs or cars, raising their fingers in varied forms of polite request or imperative demand. An endless procession wended toward elevated stations. An atmosphere of pleasure and prosperity seemed to hang over the throng, born, perhaps, of good clothes and of having just emerged from a place of forgetfulness. In the mingled light and gloom of an adjacent park, a handful of wet wanderers in attitudes of chronic dejection was scattered among the benches. A girl of the painted cohorts of the city went along the street. She threw changing glances at men who passed her, giving smiling invitations to men of rural or untaught pattern, and usually seeming sedately unconscious of the men with a metropolitan seal upon their faces. Crossing glittering avenues, she went into the throng emerging from the places of forgetfulness. She hurried forward through the crowd as if intent upon reaching a distant home, bending forward in her handsome cloak, daintily lifting her skirts and picking for her well-shod feet the drier spots upon the pavements. The restless doors of saloons clashing to and fro disclosed animated rows of men before bars and hurrying barkeepers. A concert hall gave to the street faint sounds of swift, machine-like music, as if a group of phantom musicians were hastening. A tall young man, smoking a cigarette with a sublime air, strolled near the girl. He had on evening dress, a mustache, a chrysanthemum, and a look of ennui, all of which he kept carefully under his eye. Seeing the girl walk on as if such a young man as he was not in existence, he looked back transfixed with interest. He stared glassily for a moment, but gave a slight convulsive start when he discerned that she was neither new, Parisian, nor theatrical. He wheeled about hastily and turned his stare into the air like a sailor with a searchlight. A stout gentleman with pompous and philanthropic whiskers went stolidly by, the broad of his back sneering at the girl. A belated man in business clothes and in haste to catch a car bounced against her shoulder. Hi there, Mary, I beg your pardon. Brace up, old girl. He grasped her arm to steady her, and then was away, running down the middle of the street. The girl walked on out of the realm of restaurants and saloons. She passed more glittering avenues and went into darker blocks than those where the crowd traveled. A young man in light overcoat and derby hat received a glance shot keenly from the eyes of the girl. He stopped and looked at her, thrusting his hands in his pockets and making a mocking smile curl his lips. 
Come now, old lady, he said. You don't mean to tell me that you size me up for a farmer. A laboring man marched along with bundles under his arms. To her remarks, he replied, It's a fine evening, ain't it? She smiled squarely into the face of a boy who was hurrying by with his hands buried in his overcoat, his blonde locks bobbing on his youthful temples, and a cheery smile of unconcern upon his lips. He turned his head and smiled back at her, waving his hands. Not this eve, some other eve. A drunken man, reeling in her pathway, began to roar at her. I ain't got no money. Damn bad luck. Ain't got no more money. The girl went into gloomy districts near the river, where the tall factories shut in the street, and only occasional broad beams of light fell across the pavements from saloons. In front of one of these places, from whence came the sound of a violin vigorously scraped, the patter of feet on boards, and the ring of loud laughter, there stood a man with blotched features. "'Ah, there,' said the girl. "'I've got a date,' said the man. Further on in the darkness she met a ragged being with shifting, bloodshot eyes and grimy hands. "'What the hell? Think I'm a millionaire?' She went into the blackness of the final block. The shutters of the tall buildings were closed like grim lips. These structures seemed to have eyes that looked over her, beyond her, at other things. Afar off the lights of the avenues glittered as if from an impossible distance— Streetcar bells jingled with a sound of merriment. When almost to the river, the girl saw a great figure. On going forward, she perceived it to be a huge fat man in torn and greasy garments. His gray hair straggled down over his forehead, his small, bleared eyes sparkling from amidst the great rolls of red fat swept eagerly over the girl's upturned face. He laughed his brown disordered teeth gleaming under a gray grizzled mustache from which beer drops dripped his whole body gently quivered and shook like that of a dead jellyfish chuckling and leering he followed the girl of the crimson legions at their feet the river appeared a deathly black hue some hidden factory sent up a yellow glare that lit for a moment the waters lapping oilily against timbers the varied sounds of life, made joyous by distance and seeming unapproachableness, came faintly and died away to a silence. End of chapter 17chapter 18 of Maggie, a girl of the streets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Neil Donnelly. The Maggie, A Girl of the Streets, by Stephen Crane. Chapter 18. In a partitioned-off section of a saloon sat a man with a half-dozen women, gleefully laughing, hovering about him. The man had arrived at that stage of drunkenness where affection is felt for the universe. "'I'm good feller, girls,' he said convincingly. "'I'm damn good feller. Anybody treats me right, I always treats them right, see?' The women nodded their heads approvingly. "'To be sure,' they cried out in a hearty chorus. "'You're the kind of a man we like, Pete. You're out of sight. What you gonna buy this time, dear?' "'Anything is wants, damn it,' said the man, in an abandonment of goodwill. His countenance shone with the true spirit of benevolence. He was in the proper mode of missionaries. He would have fraternized with obscure hottentots. And above all, he was overwhelmed in tenderness for his friends, who were all illustrious. "'Anything is wants, damn it,' repeated he, waving his hands with beneficent recklessness. "'I'm good feller, girls, and if—' "'And if anybody treats me right, I hear,' called he through an open door to a waiter. "'Bring girls drinks, damn it. "'What'll yous have, girls? Anything yous wants, damn it.' The waiter glanced in with the disgusted look of the man who serves intoxicants for the man who takes too much of them. He nodded his head shortly at the order from each individual and went. "'Damn it,' said the man. "'We're having hell of a time.' 
I like you girls, damned if I don't. You're a right sort, see? He spoke at length and with feeling concerning the excellencies of his assembled friends. Don't try poor men's leg, but have hell of a time. That's right. That's what to do. Now, if I sought you as trying to work me for drinks, wouldn't buy a damn thing, but you're right, sort, damn it. Yous knows how to treat a feller, and I, and I stays by yous till I spend a lot of cent. That's right. I'm a good feller, and I knows when anybody treats me right. Between the times of the arrival and departure of the waiter, the man discoursed to the women on the tender regard he felt for all living things. He laid stress upon the purity of his motives in all dealings with men in the world, and spoke of the fervor of his friendship for those who were amiable. Tears welled slowly from his eyes. His voice quavered when he spoke to them. Once, when the waiter was about to depart with an empty tray, the man drew a coin from his pocket and held it forth. Here, said he, quite magnificently, here's quarter. The waiter kept his hands on his tray. I don't want your money, he said. The other put forth the coin with tearful insistence. Here, damn it, he cried, take it. You're a damn good feller, and I want you to take it. Come, come now, said the waiter, with a sullen air of a man who was forced into giving advice. Put your money in your pocket. You're loaded, and you only makes a damn fool of yourself. As the latter passed out of the door, the man turned pathetically to the women. You don't know I'm a damn good feller, cried he dismally. Never you mind, Pete, dear, said a woman of brilliance and audacity, laying her hand with great affection upon his arm. Never you mind, old boy, we'll stay by you, dear. That's right, cried the man, his face lighting up at the soothing tones of the woman's voice. That's right, I'm damn good feller, and when anyone treats me right, I treat them right, she. Sure, cried the women, and we're not going back on you, old man. The man turned appealing eyes to the woman of brilliance and audacity. He felt that if he could be convicted of a contemptible action, he would die. Shay, now, damn it, I always treat you square, didn't I? I always been good feller with you, ain't I, now? Sure you have, Pete, assented the woman. She delivered an oration to her companions. Yes, sir, that's a fact. Pete's a square fella he is. He never goes back on a friend. He's the right kind, and we stay by him, don't we, girls? Sure, they exclaimed. Looking lovingly at him, they raised their glasses and drank his health. Girls, said the man beseechingly, I always treat you right, didn't I? I'm a good fella, ain't I, girls? Sure, again they chorused. Well, said he finally, let's have another drink, then. That's right, hailed a woman. That's right. You're no bloomin' jay. You spend your money like a man. That's right. The man pounded the table with his quivering fists. Yes, sir, he cried with deep earnestness, as if someone disputed him. I'm damn good feller, and when anyone treats me right, I always treat... Let's have another drink. He began to beat the wood with his glass. Shay, howled he, growling suddenly impatient, as the waiter did not then come. The man swelled with wrath. Shay, howled he again. The waiter appeared at the door. Bringish drinks, said the man. The waiter disappeared with the orders. That feller damn fool, cried the man. He insult me. I'm gentleman. Can't stand being sell. I'm going to lick him when it comes. No, no, cried the women, crowding about and trying to subdue him. He's all right. He didn't mean anything. Let it go. He's a good fella. Didn't he insult me? asked the man earnestly. No, said they. Of course he didn't. He's all right. Sure he didn't insult me? demanded the man with deep anxiety in his voice. No, no. We know him. He's a good fella. He didn't mean anything. Well, then, said the man resolutely, I'm going to apologize. When the waiter came, the man struggled to the middle of the floor. Girls said you insult me. I say, damn lie. I apologize. All right, said the waiter. The man sat down. He felt a sleepy but strong desire to straighten things out and have a perfect understanding with everybody. 
Nell, I always treat you square, don't I? You likes me, don't you, Nell? I'm a good feller. Sure, said the woman of brilliance and audacity. You know as I'm stuck on you, don't you, Nell? Sure, she repeated carelessly. Overwhelmed by a spasm of drunken adoration, he drew two or three bills from his pocket, and with the trembling fingers of an offering priest laid them on the table before the woman. His nose, damn it, yous can have all I got, cause I'm stuck on yous, Nell. Damn it, I, I'm stuck on yous, Nell. Buy drinks, damn it. We're having hell of a time. When anyone treats me right, I, damn it, now we're having hell of a time. Shortly he went to sleep, with his swollen face fallen forward on his chest. The women drank and laughed, not heeding the slumbering man in the corner. Finally he lurched forward and fell groaning to the floor. The women screamed in disgust and drew back their skirts. Come on, cried one, staring up angrily. Let's get out of here. The woman of brilliance and audacity stayed behind, taking up the bills and stuffing them into a deep, irregularly shaped pocket. A guttural snore from the recumbent man caused her to turn and look down at him. She laughed. What a damn fool, she said, and went. The smoke from the lamps settled heavily down in the little compartment, obscuring the way out. The smell of oil, stifling in its intensity, pervaded the air. The wine from an overturned glass dripped softly down upon the blotches on the man's neck. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of Maggie, A Girl of the Streets This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Maggie, A Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane Chapter 19 In a room, a woman sat at a table, eating like a fat monk in a picture. A soiled, unshaven man pushed open the door and entered. "'Well,' said he, "'Mag's dead.' "'What?' said the woman, her mouth filled with bread. "'Mag's dead,' repeated the man. "'The hell she is,' said the woman. She continued her meal. When she finished her coffee, she began to weep. "'I can remember when her two feet was no bigger than your thumb, and she wore worsted boots,' moaned she. "'Well, what of that?' said the man. "'I can remember when she weared worsted boots,' she cried. The neighbours began to gather in the hall, staring in at the weeping woman, as if watching the contortions of a dying dog. A dozen women entered and lamented with her. Under their busy hands the rooms took on that appalling appearance of neatness and order with which death is greeted.' Suddenly the door opened, and a woman in a black gown rushed in with outstretched arms. "'Ah, poor Mary!' she cried, and tenderly embraced the moaning one. "'Ah, what terrible affliction is this!' continued she. Her vocabulary was derived from mission churches. "'Me poor Mary, how I feel for yous! Ah, what a terrible affliction is a disobedient child!' Her good motherly face was wet with tears. She trembled in eagerness to express her sympathy. The mourner sat with bowed head, rocking her body heavily to and fro, and crying out in a high, strained voice that sounded like a dirge on some forlorn pipe. "'I can remember when she weared worsted boots, and her two feet was no bigger than your thumb, and she weared worsted boots, Miss Smith,' she cried, "'raising her streaming eyes. "'Ah, my poor Mary!' sobbed the woman in black. "'With low, coddling cries, she sank on her knees by the mourner's chair "'and put her arms about her. "'The other women began to groan in different keys. "'Your poor misguided child is gone now, Mary, and let us hope it's for the best. "'You'll forgive her now, Mary, won't you, dear, all her disobedience?' "'All her thankless behaviour to her mother and all her badness. "'She's gone where her terrible sins will be judged.' 
the woman in black raised her face and paused. The inevitable sunlight came streaming in at the windows and shed a ghastly cheerfulness upon the faded hues of the room. Two or three of the spectators were sniffling, and one was loudly weeping. The mourner arose and staggered into the other room. In a moment she emerged, with a pair of faded baby shoes held in the hollow of her hand. "'I can remember when she used to wear them,' cried she. The women burst anew into cries as if they had all been stabbed. The mourner turned to the soiled and unshaven man. "'Jimmy, boy, go get your sister, go get your sister, and we'll put the boots on her feet.' "'They won't fit her now, you damn fool,' said the man. "'Go get your sister, Jimmy!' shrieked the woman, confronting him fiercely. The man swore sullenly. He went over to a corner, and slowly began to put on his coat. He took his hat, and went out with a dragging, reluctant step. The woman in black came forward, and again besought the mourner, "'You'll forgive her, Mary. You'll forgive your bad, bad child. Her life was a curse, and her days were black, and you'll forgive your bad girl. She's gone where her sins will be judged.' "'She's gone where her sins will be judged,' cried the other women, like a choir at a funeral. "'The Lord gives and the Lord takes away,' said the woman in black, raising her eyes to the sunbeams. "'The Lord gives and the Lord takes away,' responded the others. "'You'll forgive her, Mary,' pleaded the woman in black. The mourner essayed to speak, but her voice gave way. She shook her great shoulders frantically in an agony of grief. Hot tears seemed to scald her quivering face. Finally her voice came, and arose like a scream of pain. "'Oh, yes, I'll forgive her! I'll forgive her!' End of Maggie, A Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane